Way to the West. Good morning, good evening, wherever you may be across the nation, around the world. I'm George Norrie. Welcome to Coast to Coast AM. Later on tonight, time traveling. Here's what's happening. Health officials are still searching for the source of a very serious blood infection linked to at least 18 deaths in the Midwest. The bacteria got its name from a microbiologist, Elizabeth King, who discovered it in 1959. Symptoms of the infection include fever, chills, headache, neck pain, and skin infections. The most at risk for complications are newborns, the elderly, and people with compromised immune systems. The bacteria does not usually cause illness in humans, but in recent months, it has sickened dozens and killed 17 people in Wisconsin and one in Michigan. China has deployed anti-ship cruise missiles on a disputed South China Sea island, and the missiles are raising new concerns in the Pentagon over Beijing's growing military and its vital strategic waterways. It could be a tense situation there. And North Korea has once again asserted that it will use its nuclear weapons arsenal against the United States. Unlike previous statements, however, a note from the rogue state's foreign minister insists that North Korea is now fully equipped and ready to use nuclear weapons on the United States, not just willing to do so. They are ready. Charles R. Smith is an expert on North Korea, and uh, Charles uh, has told me on many, many occasions that he used to think that uh, Kim Jong-un was a buffoon, was a fool. Uh, Not anymore. I think a lot of people are starting to get serious and and are really trying to decide now what we are going to do with North Korea. A patient who thought that she was losing her battle to cancer and married her fiancé while on her deathbed in the hospital made an unexpected recovery and recently renewed her vows with her husband. What an incredible story. She's from the United Kingdom. She had ovarian cancer, a tumor the size of a watermelon. Everybody thought, she's gone. She's history. Well, she got married to her fiancé, Robert, and somehow everything went into remission, and she's okay. She's doing much better, but they renewed their vows this week. Good for them. Well, if you're a vegetarian, take heed. They say that genetic mutations will raise the risk of heart disease and cancer. Populations who have had a primarily vegetarian diet for generations were found to be far more likely to carry DNA, which makes them susceptible to inflammation. Scientists in the U.S. believe that the mutation occurred to make it easier for vegetarians vegetarians to absorb essential fatty acids from plants. Well, authorities have arrested a 17-year-old kid. The teenager booked in New Mexico. He was one of several people who apparently smashed a flying saucer at Roswell, New Mexico. It was a decorative spaceship. It was on display at the International UFO Museum. Three people grabbed the disc spaceship. They loaded it in the back of a pickup truck. They took off. They smashed it. But surveillance tape caught them all. One kid arrested. Let's check in with what's going on in the skies these days with Dr. Sky, Stephen Cates. Stephen, go ahead. Hi, George. Uh, so many wonderful things happening, and I think we should start off with the planet Jupiter here. If you like, if have clear skies right now throughout the coast audience, look high up in your skies. You're pretty much, I would say, halfway up in the southern sky. But here's what's interesting, George. People are telling us here and reporting this. Amateur astronomers back on St. Patrick's Day evening imaged in their own telescopes with video cameras two large explosions on the planet Jupiter, meaning something indeed has hit the planet, and I don't find that odd at all, because over the last decade, five major objects have slammed into Jupiter, a total of six of these, over the last 22 years, and we should all be grateful for Jupiter, because it pulls in so much of that errant material from space. George, I'm out here with the telescope, looking at Jupiter live for the Coast audience right now, and you can follow along. You have a small telescope, take a look on the right side of Jupiter, George, the satellite Io, and the satellite Ganymede, the largest satellite in the solar system, hugs the right side of Jupiter, And I can see the shadow of Ganymede right on the planet Jupiter. Everybody can see that if they go now. To the left of it, the satellite Europa, just to the left edge of Jupiter's limb. And then way out there, you can see it, is Callisto. But George, pay attention, folks, to the evening of April 6th. We're going to have so many wonderful events happening with Jupiter and its moons, so many eclipses, so many transits. It's a nice night to prepare for, April 6th into the morning of the 7th. And finally, George, in our weekly update, and I appreciate that, Take a good look in the early morning sky, folks. If you look just before sunrise, you'll see that last quarter moon hugging the southern sky and to the right of it, George, the planet Mars starting to get brighter, and Saturn right in between, making a beautiful way to end the month of March. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sky. I appreciate everything you do.
Well, almost a year ago, almost a year ago, we had Bob Fletcher on the program talking about Incoming, the only expose of the incoming of Nibiru, his DVD. We're going to talk with Bob in a moment on Coast to Coast and get some updates on Planet X. Stand by. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. Let me tell you a little bit about Bob Fletcher, multifaceted entrepreneur, international consultant, manufacturer, merged a small toy manufacturing business in 1985 with a corporation that turned out to be a supplier of weapons for the U.S. intelligence agencies worldwide, involving the highest level of covert operations. Now, this merger placed Bob in a position of becoming a federal witness and led him to permanently becoming an investigative researcher, by the way. Um, And uh, his DVD called Incoming, the only expose of the coming of Nibiru. We're going to get updates from Bob for the next couple hours on this incredible story. Bob, always a pleasure. Welcome back. Ah, thank you very much, George. It's uh, good to be back and say hi. Um, it's uh, it's it's been uh, it's been an interesting night. It has been about a year, I guess. Yeah, I was on. we're getting close. Yeah. When, by the way, when you were making toys, what kind of toys were you making? Uh, they were well, the primarily uh, there was one main uh, toy that I. It's kind of like an invention of mine. Um, that originally we were selling to m- professional magicians, as a matter of fact. Uh, but then we realized it was like a, uh, everybody that ever saw the, the toy function wanted to take one home. They all said they wanted to take it home for their kids or their grandkids, but the reality was that the, the adults wanted to take them home for, them, for themselves. It actually was a, uh, a, we made a, it's like a puppet, a hand puppet, it's about oh, 12, 13 inches long, and it's um, uh, made. Of, it was made of rabbit fur, which we got from Europe uh, for the most part, overseas, uh, where they they where they eating rabbits all the time. So there was plenty of it available. But it was a, a raccoon, a skunk, and a fox, uh, and one was an all white fox. And uh, they, the point of the toy was that it's manipulated externally by your hands when you're holding it, but they absolutely look alive. Um, I've had uh, most people when they f- very first see it, they absolutely are positive that it's a live animal, <laughs> and it just sold like hotcakes uh, so profusely. I went, it looks like one, two, three, four. I, um, I started making them, selling them. Uh, actually, it's a part-time thing because I was at that time doing something else at the same time, and um, I uh, we started selling them to magicians. They were on. They've been on every every major magician in the world probably owns one of them, um, and so they were going great. I even opened up a um, couple of retail operations, which were, in essence, they were like magic shops. Mm-hmm. But the primary toy was it was this um, raccoon and a skunk and a fox, et cetera, uh, that we um, uh, that, that just looked like it was alive. I mean, it's, you know, it's it's very very deceptive. Again, being an interest to magicians, obviously, uh, it was that good. But uh, that's what we were doing, and the um, uh, retail operations. Uh, they were great. We were going into amusement parks, and uh, it was uh, again that was the primary attraction. Uh, where were these uh, toys that absolutely looked like they were alive? We called them. I called them spring animals, but the 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 point being actually that it was just a a large spring inside the body of this toy, and you learned how to manipulate it, and uh, it's a, it's extraordinarily a hot item. It really killed me when um, I ended up being. Uh, ripped off by merging my business with this other business that appeared to be... And what did they want your toy company for if they were suppliers of weapons? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, later, you know, once I realized what was going on and they recruited myself, they uh, initially uh, were attempted to recruit me, uh, and of course I, I didn't get involved with it, uh, but I, and I was never paid properly, so we pursued legal action. But one thing led to another, and uh, like I say, we discovered it was uh, actually these guys, which were military generals, they were the guys that actually ran the Vietnam War, period. My God, uh, the, Bob. The, the movie um, of uh, Air America, where they were smuggling the drugs and gold in and out and arms and what have you during the Vietnam War, that was uh, the those military generals that were overseeing that operation were the people that were um, involved with taking taking over my company and mer- merging it in uh, with what was technically like a, uh, a quasi-holding company, so to speak. Uh, they owned, uh, they bought and sold businesses on a regular basis. They didn't sell them very often. They usually ended up bankrupting them. Uh, but they were in and out of everything you could imagine because 
what they were using uh, and the intent with my business was the same as they had done for many years. All these little covert war operations that the United States uh, uh, covert operations carry, on, carry out on a regular basis with national security and the CIA, et cetera, et cetera, overthrowing like the Nicaraguan thing, which I ended up right in the middle of the Iran-Contra inquiry, which that was during arming the Nicaraguan uh, rebels, the Contras, and supplying them with weapons. Um, and, and, it's, and, and I don't even have trouble naming names. It was a General John Singlob, General Heine, Adderholt, uh, Heine Adderholt, uh Richard Secord, General Richard Secord. These were all the three primary guys that were, in fact, Oliver North, who was the, the key uh, uh, character in, in the inquiry, so to speak, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North, he worked for those generals, and those were the generals that basically ran all of the covert operations and, and the out-in-front military operations in the Vietnam War, period. Of course, this was several years later, and what they do is, as the old thing about old soldiers never die... They just fade away, maybe? <laughs> right, in this case, old covert soldiers never die. They just keep doing covert operations. Uh, Jeez, so Bob. The, uh, the, to answer your question in, in terms of what they needed a toy company for, uh, they used companies like myself. They wanted to recruit me to go to West Africa, uh, where they were going to expand. Like I say, they were already doing the Iron or the Contra, mm -hmm. Contra mess in Nicaragua. They were dealing, of course, on the drug side. Now, that's the, the big side of this thing, was smuggling drugs back into America after dropping weapons off in South America, they would load up the planes, fly them back into the United States Air Force bases, and offload narcotics right out of the same place. Were they going to use the toys to stuff no, them in? No, no, no. and, and uh, excuse me, I diverted off again. The bottom line was they simply wanted me to go to West African nations that they were about to expand, overthrowing one of the governments. I think it was in Angola. Uh, and the... Um, idea was that I would simply be an information courier. I would go over there. I had this legitimate toy company. I could... Um, it was go, a front. Go Strictly as a front. I can go over without anybody paying attention to me, go in, touch base with a, maybe some local manufacturers, uh, maybe buy a couple of dumb toys or something over there as with the intent of bringing them back over here for sale, and pick up and deliver information strictly as an information courier. God knows what I would have ended up being and doing. Actually, I would have been probably dead, although I was almost dead a few times later when I became a federal witness in several inquiries, actually, uh, with the Congress and the Senate besides the congressional um, inquiry with the uh, Iran-Contra mess, which was the, Nicarag the Nicaraguan business. Besides that, I got involved with them. Um, uh, I was even hired by Manuel Noriega's attorneys, as a matter of fact. Man, later on you, when, you were in all the wrong places at the right time. Well, I, I, you know, what it, it was, see, what the, the point was that these guys, the four or five primary characters with this, uh, basically those were the guys that coordinated all around the globe, all the little covert overthrow governments, supply the revolutionaries with weapons, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, on the basis with CIA and the national security, et cetera. Uh, they uh, also would be, for let's use an example, two or three of those guys may be involved with two or three other covert operatives to, to do something else. Like I said, in uh, maybe Angola or West Africa. Uh, maybe the next following year they'll be in uh, Iran, or excuse me, in Iraq or Iran, or in the case now, covert operatives are constantly involved with theoretically chasing ISIS over there and supplying uh, the different weapons and coordinating the uh, movement of weapons, etc., covertly under the radar, so to speak. And it would always be the same guys and mixed maybe with two others or two others from the left or the right or whatever. So what happened after I uh, had the nerve to shoot my mouth off and become a federal witness, uh, I would get a senator and congressman I was involved with, ended up being involved with Arlen Specter, uh, Henry Gonzalez, uh, just a whole long list of all the different congressmen and senators that were running these varieties of investigations. Uh, usually they end up the left and the right chasing each other. You know, 
all these inquiries at the congressional level are completely fraudulent. It's complete garbage. You know, the, uh, nobody's ever gotten in trouble. And even when Oliver North was found guilty and admitted to lying to the Congress and all that, everything, nothing ever happened to him. Um, as a matter of fact, he just enhanced his bank account for the following 10 years. And now he's got a television show. And uh, he literally was found guilty of drug smuggling and murder. And now, now let's, let me ask you this then, Bob. Yes, How in the world, with all this, did you get involved with the hunt for Nibiru, Planet X? Well, it, it, I wasn't. And normally, I, I wouldn't normally not even pay attention to that, George. I, that, that to me was a kind of a, you know, a, a nebulous kind of an unknown thing. It was maybe out there, maybe not, and all the rest of that. And it's kind of a, was it like a fun thing for you at the no, time? No, 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 not at all. No, I don't have time for fun things. And I'm, I'm an old <laughs> guy now, and I still... Uh, I'm up to my keister in in, uh, pursuing many, many um, interesting situations from an investigative side of things. I should be just retired and not doing any of it. Uh, But no, what happened was someone approached me and asked me a few years ago now, going back maybe three, four years, somebody came and said, we have these extraordinary amount of money disappearing out of government funding of of a, a large sorts. Uh, now we're not we're not just talking multi millions, which I was used to tracking down, so to speak, where you had a, a congressman who wanted to build a home uh, I- illegitimately with uh, stolen funds, one way or another, in Tahiti for his summer holidays, and uh, chasing that type of thing was rather regular. But this was billions, and then it ended up being trillions with a T, vanishing out of a variety of uh, covert funding, military contracts and things of that sort. And it was extraordinary money. Um, The uh, drug smuggling, which covertly has yielded huge amounts of money for criminal persons in our own government at the highest level for many years, then was like peanuts compared to the money that was disappearing. So I had been asked, would you kind of just look into it? I, you know, I said, look, I'm not doing this like I used to do it many years ago, and I don't have the contacts as much like I used to have. Uh, at the highest levels, CIA people and the Pentagon and et cetera. Hold on for a second, Bob. We're at the break. We'll come back and find out how you got involved in the search for Planet X. Planet X, Nibiru. You've heard us talk about it before. We'll be talking with Bob Fletcher about it again when we come back on Coast to Coast AM. George Norrie back with you on Coast to Coast with Bob Fletcher as we talk about Nibiru. We're talking about incoming, the only expose of the incoming of Nibiru. So, Bob, let's let's get back to how you found out about Nibiru in the first place. I mean, were you listening to Coast to Coast? What happened? No, as a matter of fact, and I know you had talked about it many years ago. You were probably the the first uh, talk radio program that had the the the, the nerve or or <laughs> was nutty enough, whichever is the right <laughs> term. But um, to, to talk about you, you actually got into it many years ago. Am I yes, we did. That? Yeah, our, our show did with Art. Uh, we started talking about it. Uh, uh, I started talking about it about 13 uh, to 15 years ago, and uh, we've never stopped. Right, and, and I, like I said, I had no interest in it, and it was kind of like so far out for me commonly. Uh, I, I wouldn't even have looked at it. But what happened, as I said, I had been uh, at somebody, uh, actually a couple of people, and they had asked me, uh, hey, you know, can you kind of just quietly snoop around and, and try to figure out where uh, th- this gigantic amounts of money was going, besides the fact that all the gold was gone from Fort Knox, and there's no question about that. That does not exist. It's gone already. And that I would include in uh, the, the vanished money related, interfaced with uh, the incoming of Nibiru. So I said, anyhow, I said yes, and I started looking at it. And uh, originally I couldn't figure it out. Uh, I mean, it just I was getting bits and pieces from a lot of directions. And then finally somebody said something about, um, well, what happened was I, I first it, it directed me. I, I ended up uh, realizing and discovering uh, in depth uh, something I had looked at a little bit in 1995 period of time, hmm. and, and that was the underground facilities. And uh, then the realization that, that every nation in the world was building underground facilities, and big ones, and, uh, uh, and in large quantities, and, and filling them with immediate use survival foods. And what I mean by that is they were filling it up with a mandate to pretty much have all these underground, um, I call them uh, hideouts, uh, created for the uh, a limited few elite 
Uh, they, you can't put everybody underground. So obviously those persons at the highest levels of what I would call the New World Order, One World, uh, New World Order right. people. Um, and uh, I, I realized how many there was, uh, how many nations were involved with putting them in underground, filling them with the survival foods, with a mandate to have them ready and filled, like at the beginning of this last year, as of about a, a year or two ago, uh, they, they were to have all of these 20, 30-year survival foods already in place in the underground facilities. And then I found out how big they were and how many there were, et cetera. And so the next question that had to be answered was, what is going on where all of a sudden over a period of 10, 15, actually it goes back about 20 years when they really started doing it seriously in the 83, 85 period of time, which coincidentally was when uh, I was involved with the Iran-Contra inquiries in 87. And from that period of time was when things changed radically in terms of the space programs, the funding, how much money was going where and where it was going and how many covert secret black operations were uh, uh, having large amounts funded, but then it was disappearing before it was even being applied to what it was theoretically going to go towards. And um, I had to answer the question, what is it that would take these people who at the very highest level pretty much are uh, pulling off uh, like you in one of your advertisements, your, one of your little uh, uh, advertising just mentioned the coup de draw of the United States of America, which yeah. is what we have witnessed, and we are literally in the middle of uh, a full coup de gras with these one world government people. And what would it be that would scare them, influence them so much that they would drop all of the money that they've been stealing for their own pockets and shift gears to where they were all going underground like, mm -hmm. uh, like gophers? To protect themselves, of course, right? What would it be? It would have to be something extraordinary. And again, it was global. Every single major nation in the world is building these underground facilities and ended up coming back to only one possible thing, and that was Nibiru Planet X, something that I knew very little about. And so I had to become a, a quick student over a period of a year, year and a half, and finding out everything I had to find out about it. Well, when were they expecting it? When had it started? When was it that they pretty much uh, somebody had made the report into uh, probably it appeared to have been Ronald Reagan, according to information that I had gotten, on approximately 1983, when they had put up the, the largest um, uh, infrared telescope into the farthest reaches of our solar system. And that was in, uh, in about 1983 when they launched that. They put it out, and apparently, to, to, the, uh, to the surprise of uh, the bad guys, uh, they came back running into the White House and said, uh-oh, guess what? That Planet X that people have been making fun of for 100 years with everybody that ever brought it up and uh, calling them um, you know, conspiracy nuts and uh, uh, astronomical wannabes and what have you, uh, that that thing existed and it is on its way back in. And at that point in time was when they started shifting on their manner of criminality, stealing for themselves and kind of shifting gears to stealing for the potential salvation and survival of their families and their people necessary to control and take over things when and this event was to take place. Without letting us know about it, obviously. And absolutely. And the bottom line is, unfortunately, that if you have something of this sort, headed back in, and it's so well documented in, in ancient history and biblical documentation and what have you globally for many, many years. This is a reality, and it is a, a large planet-type object with a couple of moons, maybe four or five moons, and it is in this huge elliptical kind of a, um, uh, an orbit, and then it comes back around. And then, of course, there's a question as to whether it's 350-year or a 3,500-year cycle, and, and that may just be in a, a misunderstanding or misinterpretation of the application use of the figure zero. And obviously, if you just take one zero off the end of 3,500, it is now 350. So there is kind of a debate on all of that. But the bottom line is, 
apparently it is out there. It is on the way back in. And again, of course, you have, you know, the big question of everybody wants to know when. Does anybody know exactly when it's going to come back and all of that? Uh, and that, of course, is the problem. But I, I went ahead with the information uh, from, from so many directions and so many people far more schooled on the astronomical side of this than I was. But I mix that with my knowledge and friends and contact relative to government and military, et cetera, over the last 30 years of being involved with those things uh, directly myself, um, putting together investigations and what have you. I put it all together, and, it, uh, and I went out on a limb and, and uh, put together a, this large presentation. It's a four-hour double DVD uh, presentation with the intent of answering almost every question that I had people asking me over the last uh, couple of years before I had put together the, uh, the DVD expose. And uh, uh, I, I covered the religious aspects where there's involvement of the um, Vatican and how far that goes back and what their involvement was, um, which even includes the creation of that large um, uh, telescopic uh, installation that they put in owned by the Vatican, but it's in Arizona. And it's called the Lucifer. Yeah, about bizarre, bizarre astronomical telescope system. Right, and basically it's a, an infrared system. The big deal with, um, uh, apparently, with the um, uh, Nibiru, it, is, it doesn't generate any light of its own, and it's no place most of the time where it's going to reflect any light, where it's not close enough to where you can look up and see it coming in, uh, you know, this afternoon. Uh, when that point does come and that does arrive, uh, we will see it. And that fits into other strange events. When people recently have been questioning why, and this goes back, my first knowledge of what I'm about to tell you goes, goes back to 95 period of time when uh, I found out that the government was supplying military-type equipment to all the police and sheriff departments all over the United States. And it was kind of like real overkill in some situations with armored cars and grenade launchers and full automatic 50 caliber machine guns and that type of equipment going into, uh, let's say, a, uh, you know, a small sheriff's department in Omaha, Nebraska, you know, things of that sort, which is kind of like really overkill. And of course, when they rolled some of those out into the black communities uh, a year or so back um, with some of the, uh, the police shootings uh, of, of people, and when the, uh, the, the citizens all of a sudden they said, well, what is that? And they were coming down the streets with the armored cars and, and that type of equipment that was, again, uh, talked about as kind of overkill. Bob, how influential was the works of the late Zechariah Sitchin uh, with his uh, work on Nibiru and the Anunnaki and, and, and the such? Well, well, yeah, this is, and for the people that are not aware, uh, Zechariah Sitchin uh, was a... Um, uh, an archaeologist and a, uh, actually a, a linguist, a linguist, I guess I don't know what the word is, <laughs> all right. And, a, and, a, and a an expert on expert. antiquity. Yes, and an expert in antiquities with the ability to decipher ancient dialects and writings of ancient um, uh, civilizations. And he had crossed the, the path looking at thousands of clay tablets that were from originally from Sumeria, and they were like 4,000-year-old, uh, 2,000, 3,000-old uh, um, writings like a diary of the people in Samaria back a few thousand years ago. And it was the story of Nibiru passing through close enough into our near, er, uh, near Earth and one of its passages and where people theoretically coming off of what he was deciphering uh, were living on one of the planets that pulls around and traveling, one of the moons, I guess, traveling with Nibiru, and that they had landed on Earth, they were um, mining the gold, et cetera, et cetera. And, of course, at that point, they were not much more than uh, pretty low-level uh, intelligence, intellect on human beings on Earth at that time. I think all of those people later uh, uh, went into uh, government in Washington. But the um, people apparently were kind of turned into slaves and... Uh, they took the gold, et cetera, et cetera. But it's a very complex, interesting story. And Zachariah Sitchin put together several books talking and describing uh, uh, the Anunnaki that uh, theoretically were the original 
um, uh, people that had come down and, and had crossbred with some of the people on Earth and all that. And his detractors, though, Bob, really came after him. Oh, well, you know, the uh, first off, you, you had the, the big problem with his, uh, his information was, was a religious thing. Uh, you know, the problem is all of a sudden it, it, it took all the basic Christian concepts and the biblical stories and kind of, uh, you know, mixed them up. Like, what are we talking about? It's, these people came down from a planet, and they were the ones that were involved. And Anunnaki was, was uh, the, the word uh, Adam came mm-hmm. from, from their dialogue as being the first man and all the rest of that with the Adam and Eve story. Yep. But it just banged heads with the with the Christian communities and, and a lot of religions. So that was his first problem. And then, of course, the second problem is people are just scared to death of anything that they don't understand, uh, you know, and, and that thing of if I can't see it myself, uh, I don't believe it kind of a concept. But anyhow, he, he was, of course, very important, but in the study and, and bringing the, the story that, and here's where it gets back to the, the Nibiru, the story was that it comes around every 3,000 years. 3,600 years, actually. Right. 3,600 30, 3, is where, what he had analyzed and, and deciphered. And it comes up, it comes around the sun, just like uh, any other, uh, even like a, a, uh, uh, like a meteor that would co- come around and go around the sun and then go back out uh, on an orbit, uh, such as um, the, um, uh, the, the comets that... Uh, What's the word I'm trying to think about? I'm using the wrong terminology here. But anyhow, the idea was that it was just on this huge orbital uh, plane, and it comes around, passes through, and when it goes between uh, the sun and the Earth, it, of course, causes an extraordinary uh, solar eclipse for a long period of time. I mean, they think it even caused the flood of Noah Absolutely. and so many other things. Yeah, and the reason, and, and yeah, all of the effects of this, the bottom line is it's, it's supposedly 10 times the size, and of course there's all these other different analogies, but uh, 10 times the size of Earth in, in physical mass and size, and uh, with it passing, not going to hit Earth, but it passes uh, and, and causes an eclipse situation, the, um, uh, the gravitational effect was such that it yanks the waters right out of the seabeds and caused the Noah's flood, as you mentioned, and then, of course, in our case now, it would uh, probably cause the uh, elimination of um, the proper functioning of all of our electronics because we're so dependent on that. We would have uh, electromagnetic impulses and the uh, failure of our satellites because of uh, the close passage. Now, additionally, what happens uh, as this goes around, we are going around on our small 365-day orbit or, uh, to, for our annual full cycle around the sun, and what will take place is when this comes in like a comet, like Halley's Comet, Mm -hmm. all right, when it comes in, it's going to be dragging millions of miles of space junk and debris, not even counting the basic four or five moons that they're... uh, uh, Little asteroids, everything. So what we would have is it will come past, we will go through it, through the tail of this thing, which will take... Uh, not too long, but we will go through the tail, and at that point we will be going through a meteor storm like uh, being biblical, a biblical meteor storm, which again is described in the Bible in several places where the fire and brimstone struck on the, on the ground and killing 100,000 or 10,000 soldiers in a single hour and all that type of problem um, being described the best they could in biblical terminology. But it is described, and it, even in Revelations, the amount of descriptions in Revelations related to this uh, period of time is, is kind of scary, but it is all in the Bible. Bob, next hour we'll talk more about your work, Incoming, the only expose of the Incoming of Nibiru, plus we'll take some of your calls on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast with our guest, Bob Fletcher, this hour. We'll take some of your calls and continue talking with him about Nibiru and what he faces. He's also got a new project called Nibiru. We'll talk about that, too, uh, and what it all means on Coast to Coast AM.
Okay, welcome back to Coast to Coast, our final hour here with Bob Fletcher. Lots to talk with him about. We'll get your calls in here as well. Incoming, the only expose of the incoming of Nibiru. Bob, are you convinced this is happening, of course, and when do you think it could happen? Are we in that 3,600-year cycle right now? Well, <clears throat> excuse me, yes, it appears. Uh, the, the best, what I try to do is tap into uh, uh, some of the several groups and individuals that have really been studying this for years and years, have spent it a, a lifetime either as a, a vocation or as an advocation, as a hobby or as their business in uh, astronomy. And the consensus of opinion is that, uh, yeah, we are in that uh, potential cycle of the return of, the, of Nibiru passing close by. And again, of course, because of, of what I had discovered, there's multiple things that, like the underground facilities and the survival foods by the, the, the millions of tons going into these underground facilities for use as if the, those person, the persons that would know before we do, um, uh, in, you know, in, in reality, uh, are, are planning to use it. They're not planning to put this stuff in there for, for use 10, 20, 30 years away. They're talking about within a short period of time. Um, the all of the biblical writings and, and the scholastic, um, even from, from actually writings on the wall, so to speak, and quite literally uh, those terms, back down to ancient documentation in biblical and also uh, writings in, in China and, and the, the Tibetan monks on top of the hills, etc. Um, they all <clears throat> come up with sort of like the same dates, and it appears that this had passed usually uh, in, around this time right now in other words in march and april hmm. like but in the the period of what in religious terminology would be said to be uh, the the time of passover and that it was originally first seen like in december or january of that previous year and then three to four months later it would be uh you know slowly getting bigger and larger in view and then it would pass around and and cause all of the grief that it had on the on the earth each time it had come around so uh, the, the feeling of, of so many of those that have really studied this, uh, uh, that part of this thing more than I have, uh, is that they, it's anticipated this year, which apparently it is not going to happen, as in this March. And uh, if not, then we probably have a breather until next March or the following March. Mm -hmm. Anticipation literally is within a five-year period or six-year period. Where are the amateur astronomers, Bob, who would spot this before we get told about it by government, if well, at all? Well, here is the problem. When I started mentioning, I, I mentioned it briefly about the weapons going into all the police and sheriff's departments, et cetera, right. for so many years, and people couldn't figure out, you know, well, what, what is the deal with that? Because it's all over the country, uh, and, and it's ridiculous amounts of, uh, and, and also the purchases in the last two years of extraordinary weapons and ammunition too ammunitions and weapons going under the banner of course of homeland security but additionally internal revenue service the forestry service and all these uh, miscellaneous services that commonly don't need machine guns and hollow point bullets to kill people so uh, that that's part of it also is the multi millions of that that's been purchased and brought in and hidden away in a variety of locations uh, now you say, okay, here's where the connection is on that. The connection being that we are never going to be told by our government that this thing is on its way in. Uh, they are never going to warn us about it, period. And if they can figure out how to divert us from people looking at my DVDs, for one example, but also anybody else where they can uh, – there's been an awful lot of uh, skilled astronomers that have died over the last 10 years – that had reached a point where they were going to come forward and talk about the Planet X and say, hey, we think it's coming, or we know where it is, or we can zero it in, or something of that sort, even though it's not visible yet at all. Um, those, an awful lot of those guys had died accidentally and taken early deaths by all sorts of uh, kind of like the Kennedy murders, you know, that sort of thing, um, from dying from all sorts of different points, reasons. But here's, here's the point on the weapons. The government is going to have to initiate martial law a few months before 100,000 amateurs start to see it in the sky. 
all right? As soon as that happens around the globe, it's going to spread like hotcakes. So here's the problem that, that government leaders, good guys or bad guys, and we don't have too many good guys any longer, unfortunately, they are stuck with what do we do? How do we handle these people? We want to have full control of the citizens before they find out this thing is potentially coming back. Because the whole globe, see, it's not even just America, the whole globe is going to go really over the edge. They're going to really go crazy on the concept of, of some kind of an astronomical event, a calamity that may not be able to even be stopped. All right? So uh, uh, they, they can't tell the people. They can't say, hey, next March, between the 15th and the 26th, the chances of this thing coming in is real likely, you know, so have a, have a nice Easter. They're not going to be able to do that. So how do they do martial law, and how do they do the control? That's where the weapons come in all over the country in these police and sheriff's departments. And part of their deal on getting them, let's say, uh, uh, troop carriers with uh, water cannons and machine guns and grenade launchers and things of that sort that have been put into sheriff's and police departments around the country, uh, they can't even afford them. But these guys love the idea of having that equipment. So the deal was that the government would say, look, you can have, here's what's available next month, A, B, C, and D, and 2,000 of this, and, and this kind of equipment, and that kind of equipment, and all the bullets to go with it, et cetera. And we'll help you finance it, or we'll figure out a way to donate it to you on you know, half value, et cetera, et cetera. Bob, I've got a million questions for you, but uh, I want to give some of our listeners an opportunity to chat with you, too. So let's go to Linda, first of all, in the state of Washington, west of the Rockies. Hello, Linda. Hello, George. Good to have you with us. Thank you. And thank you for all the valuable information you're providing us with. We'll never with stop. all your knowledgeable guests. It's really important. Thank you. And, um, Mr. Fletcher, you just answered my question. I thought, why do they need all these weapons against us domestically if they're all going to go underground and let us be taken out by space debris, but you answered my question, but I do have something else I'm wondering about, and that's the Shemitah. If, if um, we're in the Shemitah year, we are. and supposedly the culmination is going to be that event. The Jewish Shemitah, Bob, I don't know if you followed it or not, but uh, we're in it right now, and it's uh, supposed to be a moment of upheaval for us. Um, the prediction was supposed to have been in September. Hasn't happened yet, but who knows? Well, you know, uh, I, I don't know a lot about that, but I do know a little bit about it. And there's also a, see, there's a multitude, which we don't have the time to cover everything, even to come close to it um, this evening. But the, um, uh, there, there's a multitude of, uh, of events like these that are all fitting into the same time frame uh, in, in all different uh, uh, religions and documentation of of uh, ancient religions uh, and coverage and stories of how things have happened that will happen again that all fit into this. And, uh, and to, to kind of complete the, the, this lady's question or, or uh, the concern about the weapons, here's the deal. They want to have martial law declared at least a few months before it becomes internationally a known event. Something is in the sky and it's getting bigger every week as it comes closer on its uh, return around the sun, its, uh, its orbital uh, uh, run around the sun and then back out again, which, by the way, will take 150 to 155 days for it to pass behind and then come back on the other side. We will pass through the, uh, the astronomical meteorites and comets and junk, all of that. We will go through that tail two times. So there will be two periods of time during that 150 uh, or between 155 days of us going through all that mess where we were talking about fires and big pieces hitting in the oceans, causing tidal waves and tsunamis and that type of thing. Besides the fact that it will affect earthquakes and volcanoes, which, by the way, I predicted, George, and I, you know, when you predict stuff, you're really a, you're really a dummy because you're going to either, you know, the people that think you're uh, right on uh, with it, they're not, never going to say anything. But if you uh, are wrong, well, then you become the, uh, the, the community idiot, right? But uh, I predicted a few specific things that absolutely have already started to happen, and it, that's in the DVD that I did over a year ago. I said that the weather 
is going to be completely out of control. And that's exactly what has happened. We have broken records almost every week around the globe with unusual weather. The weather patterns will not be back again for a long time as this thing slowly is causing an effect uh, as it returns closer to go around the sun. And even though you're not seeing it yet, and um, by the way, I want to mention also that, that recent um, discovery that was talked about so much, everybody said, oh, gee, astronomers have actually maybe seen this thing. That's a false flag. And um, you go ahead and I mean, finish up with our caller if you want to, and then I want to also mention that false flag. That, no, go ahead. Mention the flag, because oh, we've got lots of callers, and we'll get them all uh, okay. after the half if we have to. All right. The, um, uh, yeah, you know, these two folks came forward as astronomers and got an awful lot of attention a little while back. They said, we have found what may be Planet X. And um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the coverage of that was right away distorted because everybody started reporting, quote, unquote, that they have seen this, that they have physically found or located this, um, this potential Planet X way out past Pluto. All right. The, um, they, didn't, they have not seen it at all. Uh, the one they're referring to, they did a computer projection and an analysis, an analogy of what it might be, and if it is, here's where it would be, and because it's affecting other things, we're pretty sure here's how big it is, and they gave the size and, and all the rest of that. But here's where the false flag came in with that. This was the only announcement of a potential Planet X that got CBS News, NBC, ABC, uh, CNN, everybody, all the newspapers, everybody covered it. Because what it was included with the press release was that this was so far away that it's probably thousands or a minimum of one or two thousand years before it will be close enough to affect us. Hmm. That's where the false flag comes in. Uh -huh. This is exactly what the government would release, and maybe they did. That's exactly what they were trying to say, or what they did say, was this might be it, it looks like it might be it, but everybody can just go back to sleep because it's not going to be here for a thousand years. So that's the part that everybody overlooked, and that's what constitutes it being a situation where somebody of um, a high-level power control situation has fed that story, uh, and that there are a lot of planets out that are being discovered now literally over a thousand, as a matter of fact, in the last two years, uh, that are of an infrared category that can't be seen readily or easily and potentially are of all these different sizes the, and that fit the category. But when you start talking about something that's a thousand years away, that's not the one that Sitchin was talking about and it's not the one that I'm concerned with uh, because these guys, the bad guys, wouldn't be putting survival foods in and getting prepared for martial law in one manner or another if they thought it was not coming for a thousand years. So that's a that's a, a red herring, so to speak. Sure is. Let's go to Norm in St. Louis now. Hi, Norm. Go ahead. Hey, how are you guys doing? Tonight? Good, Norm. Thanks for calling. Uh, yeah, I just had a couple quick uh, comments. So I, I pretty much study my end times Bible prophecy and whatnot for years now. So d does your guest uh, can connect the dots with uh, the Nibiru as possibly the Wormwood? And as far as the people going underground, I, you know, I know about Mount Weather. It's like a $40 billion underground bunker and whatnot and all the other ones. Uh, would that would he connect the dots there with the scripture that says the sun will scorch men and they'll hide okay. in caves and curse God and still not repent of their sins? Uh, and pretty much that's how I'll take my sure answer thing. off the yeah, So the Bible, of course, in the book of Revelation, Bob, talks about Wormwood, this object that's approaching which kind of is the sign of the apocalypse, of end times. Sure sounds like Planet X to me. Well, yeah, there's no question about it. But besides that, and I also have all of those, I addressed all the religious questions and tried to answer and show those things that, that genuinely look like uh, they had anything to do with this. We include that in the DVDs that, uh, that we put together uh, that folks can get. The, um, uh, I tried to cover all of the political, the financial, and and uh, the, the connecting the dots, it really got, uh, I mean, it blew me away once I got into it. Because I was very skeptical and laid back on this. Like I said, just looking for money originally. And when this gentleman says he's aware of um, the underground facilities, um, the, the question is, uh, there's, there's 103 of them in the United States. 
They are connected underground by, not all of them, but a good handful of them, by a complete underground railroad, a mag-levitated railroad system that runs like uh, uh, 300, 400 miles an hour on a levitated track. It's, uh, we have you know, interfacing highways where 18-wheelers, and by the way, even have, I even have some photographs of this in my website at uh, bobfletcherinvestigations.com. We have some really good pictures of some of these random things I'm talking about, but they're in-depth, including live footage underground in these, some of the facilities. You know, these facilities are not uh, 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 local Kmart stores. These are, some of them are the size of a small town. Jeez. Underground. Hold on, Bob. We're coming back for final questions and more chat about Nibiru in a moment. Welcome back. Bob Fletcher with us, of course. And, of course, we'll get to your calls in a second. So, Bob, what's the new project you're working on? Uh, well, I, as a matter of fact, I don't want to get the cart before the horse, but I, I am working on one. It is a follow-up, or started out to be a follow-up, on uh, the Nibiru situation uh, and uh, looking at the, the potential activities in, uh, with the possibility of, of interrupting it or stopping it or changing its direction. And this has turned out to be a very scary, frightening DVD, more, uh, almost more of a concern than the actual incoming itself of uh, the Planet X. I, I won't go any farther than that because I don't want to, um, again, put the cart before the horse on this situation because I don't want people to be asking me to get on a list or anything like that for, for the new one uh, until we physically announce it. I will let you know as soon as it's done and see that you get a copy up there for you guys. Okay. But um, uh, I, I don't want to go any farther than that again, but I will say that, that this will be the most amazing expose that I've ever done, and I've done about uh, about 12 pretty serious I- investigations. Uh, so that's as far as I really want to go with that. At this point, I don't want to get ahead of myself, so to speak. But you don't have any doubts at all that this object is getting close, and it's going to wreak havoc on yes, the planet. I, I, I do not. Uh, the um, uh, And as a matter of fact, to add to what I mentioned briefly, uh, some of the predictions like on the weather and all of that, um, uh, and, and the increase in volcanic activity, the increase in earthquakes, all of that has happened. But additionally, something that's being kept really rather quiet uh, that I discovered and put into the DVD and, and there a year ago, and that is that all of the planets in our solar system are being affected by something. And here's what we're talking about. The ice caps on Mars are melting the same as the ice caps on, on Earth are, rapidly melting, more than they ever have previously. Uh, the atmosphere, the, the, those that have atmospheres, uh, are all changing. The temperature and chemical content on the surface of the planets are all being affected. Their orbits are, have a variety of little, let's say, wiggles and, and moves and bumps that they didn't used to have. And uh, even the moon, that never had any kind of a surface atmosphere, is developing an atmosphere. And it's mostly, apparently, an atmosphere of, uh, that's... Uh, uh, an atmosphere of salt uh, floating in the air, uh, but hmm. it, it is something that's new. All the planets are being affected, and it started way out, not closer in, like you would think, well, it's something from the sun because of all the, the holes in the sun and the extraordinary solar flares and things of that sort. It didn't start from the center. It started out in the outskirts and came in uh, with these variety of uh, affected changes on the planets. So, and nobody knows what's causing it. Of course, they certainly are not going to say anything uh, when they did know. Like I said, they want to be underground before they let anybody know about it, uh, you know, before people finally figure out what's happening. Uh, now, people ask me, how would they do martial law? All right, it will be one of a few things, and actually, in the last year, since I first put together and finally put this together for my, the, the double DVD with all of the information on this thing, um, the the realization that they would use in their own their own writings. They say anything like this uh, has to be uh, something like martial law has to be something that would scare the citizens for their own lives. In other words, fear of death. And what we're talking about in terms of what would be used would be either a World War Three hanging over our mm-hmm. heads, the potential of that. A false flag of a UFO attack. It can be a false flag. It can be a false flag of UFO alien situation, which would not be difficult because we now have space planes that will blow 
the average citizen right off of their chair ourselves. So that would be easy to do. But the other would be either, um, uh, or a, here's the one that's most likely, and that is two or three extraordinary terrorist events on the, in the United States of America, uh, maybe even one or two with the equivalent of the World Trade Center, the Twin Towers in 2001, 9-11, which was completely a false flag carried out by American, on Americans. Uh, a lot of people don't like to hear that, but that's, that's, that's a fact. Uh, the any one of those three, uh, and it's going to be real easy. They they have to have the American people's mindset such that when they declare it, people will not question it. They will already have been scared so badly. It could be with a, a, a chemical or biological, also either one of those. But it's only going to be one of those three or four. I put that in the DVDs over a year and a half ago when I was producing it, and uh, I stand on that because as we look today. Just on the average news forecast, on a daily basis, all of those things that I've uh, just brought up that are in the DVD um, uh, are, are realities that could happen tomorrow. The North Koreans, they're completely off. Uh, you know, they're in Never Neverland. I don't know what's going on with those people. They scare me to death. Uh, well, they, know, they're and, insane. Uh, excuse let's, me. Let's, they're insane. Let's take some final calls here for you, Bob, if we can. Go let's uh, go to Cliff in Bristol, Tennessee. Cliff, go ahead. You're on with us. Hey, guys. Great show. Thank you. Um, um, I'm going to go outside our solar system just for a minute. That's okay. All right. <laughs> uh, great information, by the way. Uh, Bob, uh, have you heard of these gravitational waves they've discovered? Uh, well. Oh, yeah, that uh, came out a few weeks ago. Right. right. Yes, it did. Uh, okay, I think most people, I mean, you consider our solar system as a tiny speck. and you look at our galaxy, our galaxy is just a tiny speck among many, many billions of galaxies. Now, do you think, uh, let me ask you, wh what's your opinion on the gravitational waves? It's uh, about time and space. And, I mean, there's no way in this day and time that our technology, we could go and visit other galaxies. But what do you think about gravitational waves and and possibly visiting other galaxies, you know, within hours. Well, that's going to happen eventually. Bob, you want to take a jump at that? Well, you know, there's, first off, when I got into this, again, I'm not, I wasn't, it was not even a hobby astronomy for me. That was a part of this whole um, inquiry that I ended up doing. You know, it's this multitude of things, military, political, uh, sociological, it's a whole mess, as, a, the, the, as it turned out. So many things involved. But uh, the, there are so many galaxies, and there are so many um, uh, planets that, that can and do and will find out that, uh, that, that has life on it. That there's so much of that, and there's so much science that is brand new science. And our government has been fooling around with some of this new science. And some of that's going to be part of the, uh, the new DVD when we get finished. Uh, but it's, uh, there's so much of it that it just boggles the mind. And to try to zero in on things or do a close analysis on uh, some of the new things they're discovering, it, it's, it's, uh, it's over most of our heads, to be honest. Uh, and uh, uh, it's over the heads of most of the scientists. Uh, astronomers and scientists have no idea what's going on with our planets uh, doing all the crazy stuff they're doing. Uh, and uh, the ones that do know are not allowed to talk about it all, or they will uh, disappear. So... Um, they're all, we're only going to get what they want to tell us, and they don't want to tell us a damn thing. No, they sure don't. Ed in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Ed, it's your turn. Go ahead. I appreciate you taking my call. Sure and thing. Listen, I know, this other gentleman kind of passed on the same thing I was going to say, but the book of Revelation in the King James Bible, chapter 8, talks about wormwood, a star that's going to collide with the earth, and, of course, that's one of the judgments poured out on the earth during the tribulation period. Now, what you guys are doing basically is confirming to me that the tribulation period is very, very, very close. Oh, um, absolutely, sir. And um, and all of that's covered inch by inch in the DVDs also, uh, the, the incoming DVD. All of that's covered as well. I really tried to handle as much of that as we could. That's why it's so long. It actually is two discs, and it's a four-hour presentation. You've got to do it on two different nights or you'll go crazy. Uh, it's so much information. It's like a library on a couple of discs. Um, and by the way, I, I wanted to give some of our friends that, that are not computer-oriented, I want to give a mailing address. 
anybody that wants to get a copy of my catalog, uh, which of course is all on the uh, uh, my website. Uh, but if you want to, you can drop me a note to Bob Fletcher at Post Office Box 216, Bayview, Idaho, 83803. That's 216, Bayview, Idaho, 83803. If you want to order the DVD or get a list from us, uh, uh, feel you know use that address for, for you guys that don't want to get involved with the computer uh, website. Bob, as we look at uh, these possibilities, uh, why the secrecy? Because of panic or because yeah. of selfish, greedy reasons? Well, well, it's both. Because they want to, they they have to, particularly from their view, their thing is to to maintain control up until the point in time where they themselves are going to jump into the holes underground and cross their fingers because they really don't know what going to happen when they come out. They don't know how long they even have to be under, you know, so that's interesting. The developments on other planets, uh, potentially on two other planets as we are talking, we potentially may actually have two entire developments on other planets at this time. Uh, how how um, far they are with that, I'm not positive, uh, but the idea that we're not there already, I think you're, we're fooling ourselves. I had found out 20 years ago, and I've been doing this for 30 years, so I found out 20 years ago that when they talk about a project that's on the drawing board, they're looking forward to, let's say, five, six, eight, or ten years up the road. That means usually that they have already are about five or eight years finished with a project. They are already that far. And um, as you may, may know, I guess, the, the first supplies to be delivered to Mars is supposed to take place in two eight, 2018. I believe uh, if we are still here uh, in 2018, that by that time it will be about supply run 110. I believe we are already on two other planets as we speak tonight. There are other people who believe that too, Bob, as far-fetched as it sounds. Let's go to Linda in Salinas, California now. Hello, Linda, go ahead. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. I, I just wanted to talk about a dream I had last year. This was on April 15th. And then my dream, it was a weird dream, and uh, I was telling someone there's going to be a big earthquake and um, every piece of land is going to move. And I was telling someone in my dream, well, that prediction, you know what I mean, like a, like a prophecy. And um, like the coincidence, too, is that that person's birthday is also around April 15th. So um, I was just wondering if it was connected. Well, we, we really don't know. I mean, this would cause earthquakes too, Bob, would it not? Um, you're talking about what causing it? I'm sorry. I Nibiru wait. would cause earthquakes, oh, would well, it not? Yeah, the, well, it's, it's, already, it's already having an effect. And, and, and the potential of what's going on now with the increases in uh, earth movement and the crust and volcanoes. You know, we had the, the Aleutian Islands up there in Alaska. Uh, the, one of the big old volcanoes blew its top two days ago. We had like 47, 48 volcanic activities on a regular basis every day. And people are just, you know, they, it's kind of like there. You can go on the computer and keep track of it yourself. Um, but all of that, I believe our sun, the holes in the sun that they are now trying to, they don't know what's going on with that, giant holes that come and go on the surface of the sun. Oh, there's a, there's a big one there now. So. That's right. And they don't know what's, well, or let me put it this way. They're not telling us if they do know. I think all of it is related to an intruder coming in, Nibiru, coming in and uh, making the approach to, to do its thing. And, uh, you know, we're like, it's like a, the bathtub. If you drop uh, uh, a full bathtub and you drop the, a golf ball in it way out on one side, eventually the ripple is going to go through the whole bathtub and back again. And uh, that's the way the solar system is that we live in. It's like the human body. It's, it's interconnected, a small activity way out someplace, even though it may not look like a big activity, is affecting our sun, which is affecting our gravity, which is affecting the, the uh, quakes. The quakes and the earthquakes and volcanoes are now have been uh, directly connected uh, with small groups of earthquakes in one place. Ends up uh, in two or three weeks, we'll have a volcanic activity someplace uh, that crisscrosses the quakes. So um, it's all one big uh, let's say, like I say, one big bathtub, you drop something in it at one end, its ripples are going to go all over the bathtub, and that's what's happening to our solar system. Aaron in Massachusetts, let's get you in here. Aaron, go ahead. 
Hi, good evening, gentlemen. Hi. Yeah, I just wanted to make a statement about the Shemitah, and actually it's probably more falls in line with the book of Revelation, just the total chaos that's going on around the world. Uh, you've got all the stuff going on in the Middle East, uh, the Russians, they're over there now, um, you've got the Ukrainian issues, Africa, everything is in a state of confusion or flux. And there seems to be a dumbing down, uh, at least in America here, um, uh, I don't know how to put my finger on it. Maybe uh, you just alluded to a gravitational pulls, uh, seismic activity. All of these issues, I think, as you stated earlier, are kind of tied in. But uh, you get, I try to tell a lot of my friends, you, you, if you open up the book of Revelation and decipher it, uh, it has most of the answers there. Well, I think you. I think you're right. They're there. You just have to interpret them. Bob, we're rapidly running out of time. And would you give your website, even though we've got the link for you at coasttocoastam dot com, and again the DVD? Go ahead. Sure. It's uh, it's just Bob Fletcher Investigations dot com. Uh, the um, uh, and and again, you can write me. Uh, that address is also on there. But uh, at Post Office Box two one six Bayview, Idaho. 83803. Drop me a note if you want a copy of our little catalog. We've got about 10 exposés that are available to everybody. Um, most all of them are pretty upsetting because they're, uh, you know, showing us how criminal our government has been for so long. You know, and uh, people ask me what to do. I, uh, you know, you can't alter your life for this thing. Uh, don't be hanging around waiting for this thing to take place. You got to keep doing what you're doing and. Uh, uh, you know, you... And have a lot of faith, Bob, and some preparation, too. Bob, thank you so much for uh, returning back to Coast to Coast. Next up, we're going time traveling. We talk a lot about time traveling on this program, going into the future, back in the past. It's an amazing, amazing way just to think, isn't it? In a moment, Bob Mitchell joins us. We're going to have two guests on tonight for you, Bob Mitchell, Jason Quitt. Now, Bob will be telling the story of Jason, and we're going to be talking about their latest work they did together called Forbidden Knowledge, Revelations of a Multidimensional Time Traveler. We'll be back in a moment with Bob on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. And Bob Mitchell is back with us. Bob, of course, is the Canadian author and journalist. He covered crime and sports for the Toronto Star for more than 35 years. Now a field investigator for MUFON based in Ontario. He's an executive with MUFON Canada, also the co-founder of Toronto's Newswire service at Tor Newswire. And here he is back on Coast to Coast. Bob, always a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you, George, and it's really, really a pleasure tonight to introduce to you uh, Jason Quick, who I think your viewers are just going to find as absolutely fascinating as I did when I first met him. This is, this is a remarkable story, and you uh, two wrote together Forbidden Knowledge, Revelations of a Multidimensional Time Traveler. Now tell me your relationship with Jason. How did you meet him? Uh, well, we, I had never met him, never heard of him until last uh, summer uh, when we both were uh, giving talks at the Alien Cosmic Expo in uh, my hometown of Brantford, Ontario. Uh, I, I, I guess I did hear of him because the organizer, Joanne Eady, said I, ha- I had to meet this Capel. Uh, she thought we would hit it off right away, and, and I really had no idea who he was or, or what he, um, what his story was. Um, so I, I was sitting with Stanton Friedman uh, selling my, my book at the time, which was uh, Intrusion, Alien Encounters. Okay. Uh, and, and Jason just sort of came up to me and stood in front of uh, the book and, and had this big smile on his face. And, and he's a six-foot-five guy, so he's very, very tall. And uh, I'm looking up at him, and uh, he's, he's not saying anything, but he's pointing to the picture on the front of my book, which is a which is an insectoid, basically, and and looking back at me and and just indicating that he knows what that is and has seen that and and has heard about it. And uh, uh, so there was an instant connection right then and there. And then I I went and visited him at his booth, and he was selling uh, crystals and and uh, and a book called Egyptian Postures, which which again I had knew nothing about, uh, never even heard of it before. And so I took in his talk and. Um, he started this talk, and right away he, he said uh, that uh, he not only has pre-birth memories, but he chose his parents, and we all do. And I said, what? What does he mean by that? And uh, he started telling the story about that, and, and while he was telling the story, I almost wasn't even listening to him. It was almost as if I, in my mind I was saying, i got to meet this guy more, and i got to do a book on him, because it just sounded so fascinating and, and so really unbelievable. And um, at the time, I was writing "What If: uh, Close Encounters of the uh, Unusual Kind," and so I, I said to him, "Well, let's you know, let's get together maybe in September um, after uh, my, I was finishing the book." And he was actually getting married to his fiance in, in August. So 
um, I thought that would be a good time. And, but during the conference, um, we sort of met each other several times, and there was always this instant connection for some reason. And, and in the speech, he talked about ancient Egypt and, and his past lives there. And uh, and my wife has always had an affinity with ancient Egypt. She she doesn't know why, but she watches every show, every television mm-hmm. show, and every <laughs> book. And we have pictures in our house of ancient Egypt, and we have artifacts, and, and I have n- no connection whatsoever. So when he met my wife, there was, there was a really instant connection, almost as if they had been together in a past life or knew each other as sisters or brothers. And and it was very weird. And and, and I just said, we have to get together. And as it turned out, um, we really started writing this book. And this is going to sound incredible, but uh, just around December. And uh, it just flowed so incredibly. Uh, he would tell me things. I would try to explain it more. And, and it just flowed back and forth. So we'll, before we knew, we had this incredible book, and uh, it's only been out a few days, but it's it's starting to do well on Amazon, and, and we really haven't done any publicity about it. Well, it's an amazing story. You know, I just had a guest on, Bob, uh, talking about the Nibiru. Yeah, and you, I heard and, that. <laughs> and you, you two mentioned Planet X in this new work, Forbidden Knowledge. Tell me about your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, I, I don't think we mention it by name. Because uh, at, at the time when I asked, I asked Jason about Nibiru, and, and he said in, in all his travels and all his, the beings he has talked to and, and uh, over thousands and thousands of years, uh, it never came up as, as the word Nibiru. Um, now, I, maybe that's a word mankind has, has put onto it, but, but some of his um, extraordinary time traveling into the future, uh, which he's going to get into later on tonight, um, he basically has seen... Uh, the results of what would happen if Nibiru did come. And it's not a pretty story. And uh, I can only hope that, uh, I mean, Bob Fletcher's story is fascinating. I can only hope that he's absolutely wrong, because if he's right, um, and if Jason has seen what, what he says he has seen in the future, uh, it's not a pretty sight for mankind, and it seems like it's coming faster than, than it is. Well, and if Jason has seen this in the future, that's not a yeah. good sign for us, Bob. No, it? no, although he, said, although he says that we can, the future is not carved in stone, and he also talks about how, uh, and this is hard for people to get around, I, I think it was hard for me to understand it at first, but I'm, I'm more and more understanding it, that, that we, as human beings, uh, we're basically fourth dimensional beings trapped in a third dimensional world, and he'll tell you why we're trapped here. That it's a fascinating story on its own, but but we also live multi-dimensional lives all at the same time, and and sometimes they're just a little bit out of sync uh, in this third dimension. So basically, there's another George Norrie somewhere right now. Oh God uh, forbid! <laughs> talking, and, and there's another Bob Mitchell talking, and, and uh, so the the future that that we're seeing here may not necessarily be the future of us in another dimension, and it's our consciousness in another dimension. It's, it's the same being as we are. We just don't know each other exists. We're living a, a, almost a similar life. Uh, it, it, it's not really dimensions, but it's just some, uh, the consciousness that's everywhere in the universe. And uh, it's a really hard concept to understand, but the strangest thing about it is in the last few months, uh, people have been coming up to me when I'm selling my other books and at, at events and that's all they want to talk about is consciousness, and and it's just it's just overcoming the entire I think alien UFO industry now. It's like this movement that has just come out of nowhere, and it, and I think everybody in, on the planet is starting to talk this way. They sure are. Now the title, Forbidden Knowledge. Tell me about the title. That's pretty fascinating. Yeah. yeah well, as as I was writing it and learning all these things, um, at first I came up with the title, uh, Secret Knowledge. But uh, then I thought forbidden sounded a little, little more ominous, and, and it really is in some sense, particularly with some of the, uh, you know, his, his future um, uh, travels, because he, he talks about a, a society in, on Earth uh, where the AI intelligence controls everything, and, it, and it, while it sounds good, it actually is a terrible thing for mankind. And we also talk about in the book about how the, the story that uh, archaeologists, mainstream archaeologists, uh, historians, scientists have basically been telling people for hundreds and hundreds of years uh, is basically a fabricated lie uh, that if, if you really think about what you're being told, most of it can't possibly be true um, in the sense that most archaeologists and, and scientists in the mainstream will say that mankind's only been around for mo- mostly 5,000 years where they've been having a civilization. Well, they've now had, you know, they found artifacts that are far more older than that. There's a pyramid in, in Russia that has just been discovered and there's, that's supposed to be millions of years old. And, and so there's evidence that societies did exist on, on Earth uh, from thousands, if not millions of years, 
yet our mainstream uh, archaeologists don't seem to want to believe this, and they keep perpetrating a lie that they were told. Um, Jason goes into this about, about a lot of things that uh, we don't know that he believes are true because he's seen it, he's, he's exhibited it. Um, so it's, uh, and also the, the other thing that, for his part, is that when Jason began talking about some of these things last year, uh, he, he actually had, uh, he became very, very sick, and it, it's a, a very fascinating story. And, and without giving away too much of the story, um, I, I just want to tell uh, listeners that um, I guess you'd call it a, a past life psychic uh, hit was put on his life. And he started basically um, decaying. I mean, his, his flesh was coming off. He was getting sicker and sicker. And, and it turned out something was going on in a past life that they didn't want him to reveal in this life. And they were actually killing him in a past life. And it became a live thing in this life. Uh, and all of his friends didn't know what was going on. He went to doctors. They said he was healthy as can be, and uh, that he was literally dying in front of his fiance. Uh, he even lost about 70% of his vision at one point. So he had to do a, a healing exercise with one of the shamans that he knows, and, and he became uh, well after that. But he now knows how to fight uh, the bad energies that surround us all the time. And, and um, you know, basically one, he's talking about the vibration of humankind and how we all have to rise above our, our anger and our fears and, and just talk about love and peace. And, and I know it sounds almost hippie but uh, he makes a good point in, in, in the book. You know, Bob, uh, has Jason's involvement with you changed your views on anything? Oh, yeah, yeah, I think uh, remarkably. Uh, I, I had this, you know, vision of, of uh, you know, what aliens were and, and, and really... Uh, I started more and more believing that people uh, who said they had these incredible encounters actually did have these encounters, and and the, that the world we lived in really isn't the world we think it is, and, and that the you know the governments are hiding things that just like Bob Fletcher said beforehand. Only uh, my hiding thing was about the alien connection, not about the Nibiru or anything like that. But from from spending time with Jason and listening to his story and and um, delving into everything and the possibilities that he talks about. Um, I really think that abductions are something completely different than we think it is. Uh, I think that uh, it makes sense that, that we one time were fourth dimensional beings, that we are trapped in this third dimensional body, and that what we think is actually in front of us may only be created in our mind, because the mind is actually um, so powerful that, that you know, it can... It can formulate things. A lot of times when people have uh, abductions, I, I, I used to think that um, even the term greys, it had become so popular in our, our, our the human culture that every time somebody had, a, had an abduction, it was always the greys. But I yeah. began to think that perhaps that was only a thought that was put in our mind because we're so familiar with it, that it's something far different than that. And we can make the greys the bad guys because we already think they are. Um, Do you think... Also, Go ahead. And, and the, the multi-dimensional things too. Like he talks about what happens when when we die. Although it's not almost as if we don't die. It's just we we move on to another um, plane of existence in the fourth dimension. And 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 whatever faith you believe in in this life, when you leave this body, you will see the people that your loved ones were in this life because their energy is still going to be there where you go. And also, if you believe you've been a bad person and you're going to go to hell, that's where you'll your consciousness will go. We'll take you but there. It, yeah, but it, yeah, but as Jason says, it's not a permanent place because it's just a transcending place before we reincarnate to to something else. So um, it's a it's a mind boggling thought that he has. Um, but I think the more and more people are starting to realize the same thing because I, I said people are coming up to me out of nowhere and and. And they say I'm talking their language now, and this is a language I didn't even know existed until you know a few months ago. A lot of people have theorized that the ETs could be time travelers from our planet. What do you think of that? Um, that's a possibility because I, I remember Jim uh, Peniston uh, from yeah. the Reynolds and Forest. Uh, his famous story where you know he touched it and had this. Uh, he started doing all these uh, uh, computer logarithms and. And I think at one point he was told that they were us from the future and they were here to look for a Band-Aid, which kind of meant something about DNA. Um, but I even, again, it's interesting that Bob Fletcher was on before me because, again, I hope he's wrong because if he's, if he's right, we're all in trouble. But, but let's assume he's wrong for a second. Um, the time travel thing to me is starting to make a little more sense uh, because 
I, I thought that it might be, if time travel was possible, then it certainly would be possible to go back into the past because that's already happened. But how do we go into the future if it hasn't happened yet? So then I started thinking to myself about the secret space programs and people that, you know, insist that they've been somewhere, and especially Randy Kramer, who said he was somewhere for 20 years and then came back and he was still the same age. I started thinking that perhaps uh, time isn't what we think it is, and that right now, uh, even though we think it's the present, we are also, we are actually living in the past. And, and Jason says that when we come back, we can choose whether we come back in the future, the past, or the present. So perhaps all of us right now living this life has, has chosen to come back in the past. And so that means that what we think is the future in a space program is actually the present to them. Mm-hmm. And, and if people like Laura Eisenhower is right, where she says that there's a jump room somewhere, uh, and she was asked to go back into, you know, be part of a Mars colony, um, perhaps that's a jump room to, this, to what is the real present <laughs> out of this past. <laughs> I know that might be mind-boggling to some people, but it it might explain time travel. Some have said that it's easier to go into the future than go into the past. What do you think? You see, I I, I think it would be easier to go into the past if we had that ability, if this is the present time, um, because the past has already happened. I, I don't know how you go somewhere that hasn't happened yet, and that's my dilemma when I talk about time travel. But again... Everything we think about in this life is based on our own knowledge, our, our limited knowledge of, of possibly the entire universe. So we only think with our mind in, in, in this, these terms. So time travel seems like something that could not be possible. It's stuff of Star Trek science fiction. But perhaps in another species, another alien, it's just a normal thing. Um, because time, I don't believe, is what we think it is. Um, but again, if we're living in the past, then it should be easier to go to the future because the future really is the present. Since you've been doing this, mm-hmm. have you been convinced that uh, we are being visited indeed by ETs? Oh, ab- absolutely. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that, and I think anybody who thinks that we haven't is just uh, just closed-mindedness and just doesn't want to believe it. Uh, there are too many people that have come forward with uh, tremendous you know, backgrounds, uh, scientists, um, astronauts, pilots, you know, people like Laura Eisenhower, like the great-granddaughter of, of, of Dwight. Dwight yeah. why, why would she stick her, her neck out uh, and, and say the things she's been saying if, if, if she didn't believe them and, and she says that uh, she was approached? Uh, I mean, I, I think one of her recent speeches in, in, at the World Congress in Italy uh, that I've seen, you know, she starts out by saying that an alien invasion has already happened. We just don't know it because the governments have never led on to this. And what do they want, though, Bob? What do they want? Well, they want our genetics, I'm sure, uh, because perhaps some of them are not uh, their dying species. And, that and, could be. And, or they want and, to take over our planet. Yeah. Yeah, or perhaps we are their experiment. And, that could uh, be. You know, they control us because uh, they've always controlled us. Uh, you know, I've, I've always thought, too, that uh, perhaps a species that is millions of years ahead of us uh, obviously could, could create clones, could create... Uh, biological entities. Oh, they could do. Like they could do robots. anything. They could do anything they want to do, Bob. Okay, in a moment, you're going to meet Jason Quit, and he will talk about his remarkable story next. Okay, welcome back to Coast to Coast. Now you're going to hear from Jason Quit. Jason is a graduate of the Institute of Energy Wellness, a student of the Algonquin shamanism. He has been training and working with many teachers, shamans, and traditional healers from all around the planet. He is the author and teacher of Egyptian Postures of Power and the Yusuf Codes. He's also the author with uh, our friend Bob Mitchell, Forbidden Knowledge, Revelations of a Multidimensional Time Traveler. We're going to have Jason tell his incredible story now. Jason, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. Now, Bob was kind of setting the scene for how he met you and the incredible story, but uh, we want to hear it from you. Tell us what the heck has happened. Okay. Well, this is a long story that can probably take your show up for a couple weeks. <laughs> but We'll do it in segments over the next year, huh? That's right. Well, you know what? I'll just start off as a good introduction of, you know, Bob talked about what fascinated him was my story of, choosing my parents. And I think that's a good place to start because ever since I was a young child, I always had a memory of coming to this planet with many other children and 
Um, it was almost like I was walking down these hallways with many other children. There was uh, women there that were directing the flow of these babies. And um, one of these women said, it's time for you to choose your parents. So I was very happy, and I followed this woman down another hallway, and there was a tiny little door. It was just the size of um, that only a baby can fit through. So as I entered this room, it was almost like a movie theater, and I saw this great big portal open up in front of me, and I actually got to sit there and view my parents before I was born. Oh my gosh. Well. And I remember watching them before they were married, watching them um, when they were getting married, getting their photography done. And then when I first started to learn how to talk, you know, I would go up to my mother and say, huh. aren't you happy that I chose you? <laughs> and I think we all have that selection, don't we? We just I, can't remember it. I personally believe we do. And it, I guess if we all knew that we choose our parents, um, it would save a lot of money in psychiatrist bills. It sure would. <laughs> it, it sure would. So... So you're already tuned in then at a very early age, Jason. You've got this understanding, this ability. Let's let's move from there. Something happened in your life that dramatically changed you. Yes, and this was in my early 20s, and I started to have um, sleep paralysis experiences. And I'm sure uh, your viewers are aware of this condition. Um, you wake up in the middle of the night, your body is completely frozen and paralyzed, and your mind is completely conscious. You think it's, you're dying, don't you? It's incredibly scary, because you're, you're basically yelling in your head to wake up or move a finger or, you know, like, you know, what's going on? You're trapped in your body. And this started to happen once a month, and soon it was happening once a week. And as this was happening, I started to notice that I could sense presences walking around my bedroom while I was in this state. So that really freaked me out. And, you know, obviously you go into fear, and I thought, you know, this is the beginning of an alien abduction or some type of demonic possession. There's just something in my room, and it doesn't feel good. And one night I just couldn't take it anymore. And I said, that's it. <laughs> this is not happening again. And I was screaming in my body and trying to shake myself to wake up. And... Mm -hmm. I shook so hard, George, that I popped completely out of my body and had an outer body experience. Maybe just to get away from all this, huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was not fun. In fact, a lot of my experiences aren't fun. And as I rose out of my body, I could see myself laying there on the bed. And standing at the foot of my bed was a very tall being. Um, his head almost touched my ceiling, which was nine feet tall. Did it look and human? It looked like a Grim Reaper. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, it looked like this cloaked, big shadow. And I was not expecting this to happen. You know, so it was, it, was a, it was quite a shock to leave my body. But then it was even more of a shock to see that there was someone in my room with me. <laughs> so that scared me so much that I literally was sucked back into my body. Okay, with this dramatic jolt, I guess, that feeling that you always get when you hit. Oh, yeah. And, but, you know, completely aware, completely conscious of what just happened. So at that point, yep. it or they aren't really showing you things yet, are they? No, this was almost my wake up into this new world. And the most amazing thing is after I left my body, I never had sleep paralysis ever again. And what it did do is that I could actually consciously put myself into sleep paralysis <laughs> because I was curious. I wanted to leave my body again. You know, you had this kind of curiosity about it. So I could actually put myself to sleep, but keep my mind completely awake. And I would just start to wiggle myself and try to push myself out of my body. And I actually got quite good at doing it. You, you were the perfect astral projector. Robert Monroe, had he still been alive from the Monroe Institute, who was an expert in astral projection, would have said that whatever you were doing, you were doing it the right way. I guess so. And, and I truly believe that even though that being was very scary looking, um, it was there to awaken me to this world. So the fear that I had was the fear that I actually just carried inside of me. It had nothing to do with the situation. Now, at this point, are you time traveling? No. Okay. When I, when I started to leave my body into this fourth dimension, other beings started to notice what I was doing. 
and they would come at night, and they would literally just reach in my body and pull me out. <laughs> they'd, they'd, now, they'd induce your astral projection a little quicker than you wanted to. Oh, yes. It was just like, okay, this guy's awake. Let's just go get him. Let's get him. He's going to pop out anyway. Let's grab him. Yeah. So, um, And this is where the time travel started. Okay, so it's, so time travel for you yes. started without any machine or apparatus, but with out-of-body projections. Yes. Okay. And actually, you know what? Let me tell you and your audience what time travel is. All right. Because I don't think people have got it over it too well. Um, when we're in the third dimension, you know, we're moving through time, and we, it's almost like we're moving through time horizontally. So we actually create the future with our free will, and what we choose to do in our life. So we all time travel in horizontal time. <laughs> do time you, travel, when you're doing this, though, do you have the control over it? Um, not at all. None. Okay. No. No. But the time travel that I've been awakened to, um, we'll call it vertical time travel. And what that means is that once I leave my body and I'm in the astral state, that is the platform where you can travel dimensionally through time and space and through parallel worlds and parallel timelines, either the past or the future. So you, so you are going in the past as well then? Yes. Can you pinpoint, though, or how do you pinpoint an era? What if you wanted to go back to witness Jesus you know, doing his sermons uh, with the apostles all around him on, on a hilltop or something? How could you, know, you, how could you pinpoint that time period, or can you? I can't. I can't at all. In fact, all my journeys have been uh, done by other beings. So in the past, when you go back, you don't have any control over where you're going or when you're going. That's right. And most of the times, I don't even know where I am or what time period it is. <laughs> you just appear there. That's right. So uh, for, the, for the experiences going into the past, Jason, how far back have you gone, and where have you gone? Well... The, the truth is I couldn't pinpoint a location, um, but I think the earliest I've gone back in Earth's history, um, it was still, uh, like, the sky was black. It was a fire, I call it the fire world. So we're talking um, uh, billions of years ago. I, I don't know. <laughs> it could possibly be. You know, there was, um, and there was a temple there. Or it could have been the asteroid period 65 million years ago. Who knows? It, it definitely could be. It was very volcanic. You can see the, um, the glow of the red coming through the ground in some places. Um, and I've actually been shown uh, the Earth um, actually going back in time very, very quickly, where I was shown the continents going back together um, to the one continent and breaking it up. And they actually showed me that the Earth has been through at least, at least five major events, and there's been civilizations in all five of those events. Remarkable. Into the future, where have you gone? Okay, well, let's just say that uh, tonight is very synchronistic because this whole week I've been getting questions from people about Planet X. Hey, and that's and what we've have, been talking about all night, too. I know. So, And, you know, people keep asking me about it, and I said, honestly, I've never seen a planet in my journeys. I've, I've never seen this. No one's ever told me this. Um, so from personal experience, I don't know this. So my first time travel experience, I was taken into the future. And let me explain how this happened. They'll pull me out of my body. I'll fly up into outer space. I'll see the earth below me. And they'll point to where we're going. And they'll shoot me right back down to the planet. But when I get there, I'm in a different time zone or a different timeline. Time, time, timeline, okay. All yeah. right. And the first one they drop me off in. And Do they tell you when or where they're sending you? No. Oh, there's only been a couple instances where I get a telepathic story that goes along with where I am. But they generally don't say, oh, we're sending you to the year 3000, you're going to New York City or something like that. Um. Yeah, that's actually happened a couple times. Oh, has it? It has, actually. Um, but at the beginning, there was no conversation whatsoever. It was just pull me out, take me up, take me down, drop me off, and I would be an observer. And when I mean an observer, it means I'm invisible there. I'm just there to witness. No one can see you. 
No one can see me. Are they it's as about- alive as we are right now? I believe so. I, I believe I'm actually witnessing a real event. And I'm in the astral form, so I would be in the fourth dimension or higher. So they could not actually see me there. Any idea what time period you were in, in the future? Um, I want to say not so distant future. <laughs> like 10 years from now, something like that? Uh, it could be. And, but I've always, you know, there's a lot of fear in what I have to say. And we're going to get into, well, I, I would guess, though, that technologically speaking, you would be able to tell a difference between what we have today and what you would see in the future. So if it were way out into the future and we had flying cars everywhere and stuff, you'd know that. Yeah. No, this was very close in our to where we are now. Future. Yes. Okay. And the first thing that they dropped me off in, the earth was completely scorched. The sky was. It, the sky almost looked like it was burnt. It was red, like very, very dark red, the sky. And this is the future? This is the future. That's not and I was I was just looking around this desolate uh, place, and you can see trees that were just burnt like cinders. And then the beings pulled me, my consciousness down into the earth, and they pulled me into one of these underground bunkers. And I got to see a person in one of these bunkers. and. They were suffering. They were burned, they were, scorched? They weren't burned, but there was definitely something wrong with them. They were, they were not doing well. <laughs> Do you have any idea what caused that scorching, that burning, that destruction on the planet's surface? I have no idea. Um, I you know, always thought it might be like a, a nuclear war, uh, but then I started to think that it might be a, a solar flare, but, but but well, a solar flare won't scorch. What a solar flare will do, yeah. Jason, is yeah. shut down you know electrical and everything else. So we'll luck out on that end. But okay. a plasma burst, you know, from the sun, that's different. And mm-hmm. you know that that would be like a ball of fire that would be sh- you know shot our way. That could and, do that. And then I started to look into this Planet X thing just this past couple of days. All right. Uh oh. Here we go. Well, the the Hopi. Um, prophecies and what they said would happen in these events, um, they talked about the sky being burnt. They talk about the earth being scorched. And it was like they were describing what I've seen. And I was taken on these journeys in 2002 and 2003. So I've been holding on to this for quite a long time. So we're getting close based on, I think, the time period you were in. I I think so. And the next one was was even worse for me. Um, they did it again. They took me out and dropped me back off on somewhere. And oh boy, the sky was exactly the same. So I I noticed the sky was exactly the same red. And but this time I was in a uh, prison camp. You were in and a prison camp. I was in a prison camp, and I was just the same. I was an observer, but this wasn't a normal prison camp. This was a, a prison camp for children. How were they and dressed, if I can ask? They were wearing normal everyday clothes. Not not specific uniforms. They were not wearing uniforms. Okay. And um, now, you sh- like are you sure it was a prison camp, as opposed oh. to um, a holding tank? A holding tank. Well, it was um, co- very high concrete walls with barbed wire. Ooh, that's not good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and um, there was, and it was a big area. It was a very large area, like a big field. And there was a, a tank in there, and there were uh, soldiers. But all children? All children. I would say between the ages of 5 and 13. I wonder what happened to their parents. I don't know. But all I'll say is it was probably the most terrific thing I had to witness in my journeys. And, 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 and you still don't know, though, whether it was man-made created, like some kind of nuclear war, or whether it was some calamity from the solar system. That's correct. There, there's only been one experience that I had where they actually showed me a mushroom cloud type of event. Yeah. So, did, now, did that come before or after what you've been seeing lately? Uh, it came after. 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 Yeah. So not only do we get slammed by some <laughs> calamities from outside the solar system, we're, we're going to get hit with nukes, too. We're going to come back with Jason Quitt and, of course, Bob Mitchell, and we'll take your calls as well as we talk about this incredible time-traveling episode. 
Bob Mitchell back with us along with Jason Quitt as we talk about Jason's incredible time-traveling experience, and they documented all of this in a book called Forbidden Knowledge. Let's find out who these beings were that visited Jason. Were they angels, ETs? Who were they, people from the future? Maybe the past. Who knows? Let's find out in a moment on Coast to Coast AM with, of course, your calls. And welcome back, Bob Mitchell with us, Jason Quit, Jason, uh, Bob's with us uh, as well, and I'm going to get you both on as we talk about this incredible story. But at, at this point, who were those beings that visited you in that state that you were in? Have you, have you ascertained that? Um, it took many years to figure it out. And what I've come to the conclusion is, is that they're actually um, part of my extended family. <laughs> your, your, your real family? Uh, no, well... I'll call them the celestial family or dimensional family. All right, but they're not angels. Can we rule that out? They're not angels. Um, ETs, maybe? Oh, yeah, there are some ETs. All right. And But when I call them family, I mean what I learned is I've actually lived many past lives as an alien being on a different planet Aha. or dimension. And we have strong connection with those families, and they come to visit us in this life if well, we're open to it. Bob, I'm going to bring you in here, and what I'd like you to do for a couple minutes here before we go to to calls is, uh, sort of as a field investigator, uh, kind of like chat with Jason for us, if you would, almost as if you're interviewing him as a MUFON investigator. Um, You heard a little bit about what we talked about with him uh, last hour, but go go ahead. I'm very curious to see how an investigator would handle something like this. Okay, good morning, Jason. Good morning, Bob. Can you hear hear me? You're good. Um, I'd be curious to know that when you're having these experiences, these out-of-body experiences, um, do you hear and feel things, do you, or, or is it silent? Or do, are you having communications, or do you hear other people having communications, uh, particularly when, when that prison camp happened? Could, could you sense what was going on there? Oh, yeah. I was totally immersed in the environment. Um, I could hear the sounds. I could feel the wind. Um, I could hear... Uh, the voices of the children, the soldiers, and not only that, I was, all, I could also feel the emotion and what people were thinking. So it was almost like experiencing things on multiple levels. And, and how do you know that you're not just having this incredible dream, that it's a real experience? The only way I could describe it is when you're in this state, everything is heightened, everything is different. And it actually feels more real than being in a third-dimensional physical body. You actually have uh, more abilities, more, uh, I would say, um, emotions, where you can actually feel things uh, very differently. And you can actually move through different states of consciousness while you're in this. And, And most of the time, there is a telepathic communication going on. So if I have a question in my mind of what's happening, there will be a voice that actually explains the situation or where I am or what's happening. Is there anything that you've experienced that you can validate in, in this life that proves to you that, um, that you, what you experienced, you really did experience? You know, when I first started uh, this journey, it was right at the beginning of YouTube. It was right at the beginning of the Internet. And a lot of these things, I had no idea what they were showing me and what they were telling me. And even when I remember one experience, they took me and they they dropped me off for a while in what I would later find out is a FEMA camp. And at that time in my life, I had no idea what a FEMA camp was or what it looked like. All I knew is I was in this place. And then later I realized, wait a second, this was a FEMA camp I was in. So a lot of things um, get revealed over time that verify these things. So what was this FEMA camp all about? Um, Well, I was, like, dropped off. I was just an observer, and as an observer, I can kind of just float around and experience uh, the thought forms and emotions and what's what's happening in the environment. And in this uh, time travel experience, what I found very strange was that the families that were in these camps, and these camps were filled with families, they were all extremely grateful to be there. They were all very, very happy that they were there. Um, So I couldn't understand why that was, but I also felt that there was a lot of tension between them and I guess it was some type of 
uh, military or policing force that was guarding this camp. And they, there was no communication between uh, these guards and the families. So there was a lot of talking under the breath, and there was a lot of um, mistrust happening at this base. But when I tuned into these uh, guards, they were also very scared, and they didn't know what was going on. So, And, and this, this was back, I believe, in 2003 when I was taken there. A lot of people claim to time travel. Um, do you sense that there are more people like you living on this planet at this time period than we really believe there are? Or are you unique in this whole scenario? Um, actually, I've been shown in my journeys that there are thousands of people like me. And they are higher dimensional beings that have in incarnated on this planet. And they actually showed me a map of this planet and they showed these beings as lights on the planet. And some of these beings were very bright and some of them were very dim. But these were the beings that have come to the planet at this time um, with specific tasks and duties. Have you ever met any of these other beings? I have, actually. I've, I've met them in the astral state, and I've actually bumped into a couple of them um, physically. In, in, the third, in this world we live in now? Oh, yeah. So what, what is that like? like how, how does that come about? Did you just start having a conversation with them? Yeah, you, just, you, know? you start having a conversation. It usually starts you know, the conversation of consciousness and healing, and then it gets into weird topics, and you realize, wow, you know, we actually share similar experiences. I'm going to jump in now, Bob, and, uh, and yeah. Jason, of course, sure. uh, with uh, truly a remarkable moment for Jason, of course. And I assume, Jason, this is still ongoing? It is ongoing. Are you glad it's happening to you? Um, I'll tell you, I really didn't want these abilities. <laughs> I, I, but now it's just, it's just part of my life. Uh, it's, for me, it's totally normal. Bobby seems like he's on a mission to get the word out on what's well, happening. Yeah, I mean, George, you, you got to get Jason to talk to you about uh, what happened to him last summer, just before he had his appearance at the Alien Cosmic Expo, because it's a, a truly frightening thought that something like this could ever happen. Uh, All right, Jason, what thing. happened? Before we get to calls here, what happened to you? Okay, I'll try to move through it very fast. Um, and I really don't like talking about these things because. Um, you know, nobody should go through what I've been through, truthfully. And uh, basically, I gave a speech, and I learned very quickly that it's good to be the second person to say something new, not the first person to say something. <laughs> so I, I think I revealed too much information that has not been publicly made yet. And as I was doing this, um, I started to get very, very sick. And what happened was is I started to get... Um, it almost looked like a hive on my arm, and like it spread to all over my body, and my whole body blew up. Uh, I looked like a boxer that just got beat up continuously, and um, I couldn't eat. I lost my vision, and I just laid in bed for about a month, and each day was worse than the next. Oh, gee. Did you think you were dying, Jason? I. There was no question that I wasn't dying. There was. I went oh. to every doctor I could. I got every test done to me and they were scratching their heads they said I was a medical anomaly because my test results show that I'm healthier than a normal person yet I was my skin was literally falling off my body oh my god it was, it was extremely painful Ugh. yeah and um, anyways you're, as you're... I was in the states you know I was calling all my friends who are psychic healers and shamans and they were they were trying to help me and during this time past life came back and I realized I was having a reliving from the time back in Egypt um, mm -hmm. because I'm very closely connected to Akhenaten. And I started to see this lifetime where um, Akhenaten was, um, there was sorcery done on him and he was energetically poisoned. And he was placed in a sarcophagus and they put in a bunch of scarab beetles and that's how he died. So that, what an awful way to die. And when I realized his death, and what was happening to him in that lifetime, I looked in the mirror, and it, I swear I was being eaten alive by invisible bugs. That's, that's exactly what it looked oh, like. What a horrible feeling that is. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Anyways, I called my, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Peter Bernard, who's an Algonquin shaman. Uh, he is, he's a master, master shaman, and 
Um, he did a healing on me that night, and the next day I was feeling better, and in a week, my skin scabbed, fell off, and I was like a brand new person. I, I, I you were like molting. Yeah, like huh. I just shedded my skin. It was very strange. Yeah. And, and you had butterfly wings or something, huh? That's right. <laughs> All right, let's take some calls here for both of you. Yeah. We'll start with Aaron in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Good morning, Aaron. Thanks for joining us. Hey, it's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Sure thing. Okay, so my question for Jason is, uh, for these out-of-body experiences, I was over at a local bookstore, and they had mentioned what you can do is actually go and summon your spirit guide and ask him random questions. But I'm going to add a little twist to this one. Uh, for some reason, I've had difficulty getting a spirit guide, so I looked into the pagan gods, and I was wondering, have you ever considered uh, having an out-of-body experience and then summoning a pagan god, for example, maybe Hypnos, the god of sleep? Um, truthfully, I don't. I've never actually summoned uh, anyone. Um, what I've found out is that you don't even have to leave your body, which is amazing. And this is something that everybody can do. Um, have you ever experienced lucid dreaming? Many of us have. Okay. When you are lucid, and let's say there's a person in that lucid dream, turn to them like they're your unconscious or subconscious mind and ask them, I would like to ask you a question. And just ask them any question you want, and they will actually answer it for you because it's almost like your higher consciousness will speak through that experience. Well, that's good uh, Good points here to be able to do that. Uh, can anything and, happen to somebody if they're in that state, though, Jace? Uh, yes. It is not a friendly world. Um, no. The fourth dimension is... is uh, remember, uh, the fourth dimension or astral world, everything is amplified. So if you have negative thought forms, if you carry heavy emotions, uh, if you have past traumas and wounds, those are like beacons of energy that call on beings that resonate with those energies. So if you're going into the, that world with a lot of fear, the beings you're going to encounter are not very nice. So let's go you to, really, let's, really have to change your, your mindset. Let's go to Massachusetts now. James with us. Hey, James, go ahead. Hello. How are you today? Good. Thank you. Sorry about that. I'm just trying to fix my phone over here without the speaker. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, I just wanted to talk to all of you guys. This is my first time calling, so I'm slightly nervous, even though I'm doing the best I can over you're here. You're doing great. <laughs> My question to you guys, and first I'd like to say uh, to Jason and Bob that myself, in my opinion, I also have an awakening and an experience. Nothing as dramatic as all of you have been saying, but uh, something that kind of turned my world upside down, and now I'm just starting to realize day by day of how to see things, but not to go completely uh, uh, out of the point. My question to you is, is what about the technology we have today coming up, uh, especially going through like virtual reality? Is that a possibility that compared when we look at space, and space is so far away, and we're thinking that aliens or some kind of entity could be coming from there, and it's very possible that it's true, but could we be opening a doorway of us not knowing and going into an undiscovered country through virtual reality? And from a lot of people who are supporting this are really looking at this as not just visual and sound, but also emotions and so on and so forth from different very powerful people, at least for what I've read so far. Um, I'd like to actually under, uh, uh, ask, what do you think of these technologies that are coming? This is not something that we're guessing. They are happening. And what is the next step? And have you seen anything in the future yourself on these kind of technologies? Sorry Jason. about that. All right, Jason, we'll let you take yeah. that for the time remaining. Go ahead. Okay, uh, great question. And absolutely, um, being human, we have a very powerful creative ability. And using our minds and emotions, we can actually create the reality around us. Um, so by entering ourselves in some type of virtual reality, um, we will actually manifest that on a um, higher consciousness level. So it is almost like a consciousness trap where you can create a false reality and you can almost hold somebody's conscious in there like a net. So I don't think that's a very good idea. Bob, let me bring you in here for a second. What's, what, what happens next with someone like Jason and his abilities? I mean, can you get uh, more information out of him for the future? What do we do? Oh, I, I think with there's, it's unlimited. Uh, we've talked about that, that, that uh, there's a potential for uh, our, our first book, uh, Forbidden uh, Knowledge, to be one of a series. Uh, he's continually getting new experiences, new downloads, and, and new um, ways of looking at our, our humanity. Uh, so I, I think you know, we're going to proceed 
in that direction. Um, him and I are both going to be giving a, a talk together at this summer's Alien Cosmic Expo, and we're also doing individual talks on other things. But uh, I, just like, like I said before, more and more people are coming up to me talking about uh, our source and our consciousness, and, and Jason has tapped into that, and, and I just see much, much more happening, provided uh, Buck Fletcher is wrong. <laughs> well, Bob, can things be altered if, if uh, Jason comes back and says, this is what I see in the future? Is it things that will be or can be, Bob? Um, I think Jason told me that uh, the future is not carved in stone. And as I said, we live multiple lives all at the same time. So perhaps one future is the uh, Nibiru coming, and perhaps in another t- timeline, um, it, it doesn't come. Or events can be altered. Let's talk more about that and take final calls in a moment on Coast to Coast AM. On our next Coast to Coast program, investigative reporter Linda Moulton Howe joins us. She's back with some great stories of high strangeness. Okay, welcome back to Coast to Coast, our final segment. We are with Bob Mitchell, of course, the investigator, and Jason Quitt, the time traveler. Their book is called Forbidden Knowledge, Revelations of a Multidimensional Time Traveler. And Jason, we were talking about events that might be or could be, and you believe the future then can be altered in some respect. Is that true? From my understanding, uh, there are many timelines um, interweaving right now, and it's the collective conscious of, consciousness of humanity that is taking the steps to choose which timeline they would want to experience. Well, now so that's we kind of ex- that's exciting, though, that we might have that ability in some cases. We absolutely have that ability. <laughs> now, Earth calamities, Bob, as we've been talking about, they might not be as easy to fix. Well, you wouldn't think so, although, um, and Jason can explain this far better than I can, but it all has to do with uh, changing the vibration of mankind, um, to change the path that we're on, and the only way to do that is to get rid of our, basically our bad karma and have the entire world um, think, I guess, good thoughts. But, but Jason can explain that a lot better than I can. Go ahead, Jason. Our thoughts and our emotions actually influence the environment we live in. So, um, and it's not just thinking good thoughts. We carry those frequencies within us, and it's about healing those energies, letting them go, and transforming them. And as we do that, we not only shift ourselves, but we start to shift the people around us, and then we start to shift the environment around us. Jason, have you found a common denominator of these trips and travels and messages that you're beginning to get? Is there anything that seems to pop up a lot? The only message that I've been getting for, I think, the whole time I've been doing this is you have to heal yourself. And they say, before you can do what you can do, before you can make changes in others, you have to first take the responsibility of healing yourself. So that has been the consistent message is we need to heal at an individual basis first. The next time you're with them, can you request where you want to go time-wise? Um, I can try. I would be very interested to see what happens in the years up there, uh, 3,000, 4,000. Hmm. Well, the- let, let me ask you something. If, if in the year 3,000... There is no more planet the way we know it. Something has happened. Would you see that when you're there in that time time period? Um, probably, but I have not been there. The, f- the furthest I think I've gone is around 2,700. And what's technology look like around then? What are they, What are we doing? It's unbelievably incredible. Um, everything is... Uh, 500 years from now. That's amazing. I would say... Um, well, this actually took place after um, a historical war for um, the Earth by two different alien um, races. But after this war, um, it was decided that there was no government to be uh, placed in this timeline. And instead, the entire world was placed under an uh, AI consciousness. And this consciousness was uh, installed into every human, and it was in every technology, every building, so you are basically interfaced with not only every person around you in the world, but you're interfaced with your technology and even the buildings that you walked into, you can communicate telepathically. Okay, let's go to some more calls. We'll go to Bud in Ventura out there in California. Hi, Bud, go ahead. Uh, hold on there. Here you go. I'm, I'm here, I'm here. Okay. 
Anyway, I just wanted to say that uh, when uh, your guest was talking about uh, his childhood things, as a little kid, uh, two, three years old, I had uh, nightmares uh, running through this bad, really bad place, like a war zone or something, and eventually falling off a cliff and falling towards this light, and I ended up in my tennis arms. And so I can kind of understand where he was coming from as far as uh, going through hell and then, you know, uh, being in a place that he thought was uh, a really good place. And uh, ever since that time, I've always believed that uh, we, as human beings, uh, spend more time uh, as sentient beings or whatever you want to call it uh, than we do in our physical bodies, at, you know, when we're alive as we are now. Now is I'm 63 years old, so I'm talking about back in the 50s when mm-hmm. in my house there was no radio, there was no TV, there was no anything like that. Well, there's no there's no question that our ability in time uh, to perfect ourselves. And Jason, have you found in in your particular case, are you a better person now because of this? I'm a completely different person now. Um, my life flipped 180, and um, I, I, you know, I see the world completely differently. I observe people differently. I, I listen very carefully, but I don't just listen. I, I can feel what people are thinking or their emotions while they're speaking or in situations. So it, my whole reality has been shifted from this journey. But I didn't hear you say you're a better person. Oh, I'm definitely... Am I a better person? I think I've always been a good person. (laughs) Okay. That's fair enough. Yeah. Let's go to John in Delaware now. Hello, John. Good morning to you, sir. Hello. Good morning, George. How are you? Good. Thank you. Yeah, I just have a question for Jason. Um, This has been, it's been a a bunch of years now uh, since since I've experienced what I believe was sleep paralysis. Um, But uh, I was just curious, you know, I felt like every time that, maybe I was able to escape the sleep paralysis after however long it lasted. I almost felt like when I woke up, if you will, like my body was just like drained of energy. Is that how you felt before you really like knew what was going on? Yes. And um, the reason you're drained with energy is that it takes a tremendous amount of energy to make that jump in, I would say, it's vibration to the astral realm. Um, and it's almost like you have... Um, a lot of wounds and a lot of energies that you're carrying that is actually siphoning your energy to somewhere else. So um, the, what I learned how to do is a, a practice called Qigong, and that built up my energy where I was able to take more control of those environments. That does work too, Jason. Mm-hmm. It's an incredible tool. So, Bob, what's next for both of you? For both of us? Yes, sir. Uh, well, as I said earlier, we're, we're going to be um, appearing together at the Alien Cosmic uh, Expo at June 24th to 26th in Brantford, Ontario. Um, and we're appearing individually there, too. Um, we're going to be appearing at the Toronto Health Show uh, July 8th, 9th, and 10th, where Jason has his booth uh, there uh, called the Crystal Sun Booth, and the book will be for sale there. And we're just going to continue to uh, spread the message for the, uh, this book. It's it's becoming uh, very popular. A lot of people want to want to find out what uh, Jason has to say, and we've really only touched the surface here tonight in this, uh, in this show. As Jason said, we, we could talk for four hours and, and probably still only touch the surface. Uh, um, it, it's an incredible story, and you know, we're, we're posting it on our websites, and we're, we're trying to, I, I think, I, I'm the messenger too, that I'm trying to get the message out that Jason's trying to show people that there's a way to, to save this planet, and uh, all's not uh, lost yet. Uh, but we have some work to do. So can you tell us who the president's going to be, Jason? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I don't know that, but um, I think if uh, Trump gets in, it will be a very entertaining four years. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to Robert in Baltimore. Go ahead, Robert. Take it away. It's a very fundamental question that needs to be asked, and that is when uh, uh, Jason went back in time to the past, he was able to sense not only the physical world, but the, the emotional and, and mm-hmm. the psychological feelings and thoughts 
the telepathic, but uh, it sounds as though he was not able to influence it in any way. And that, that gets to the very fundamental question of the paradox of time travel, because if he cannot affect it, then we don't have a paradox anymore. If he can affect it, then we have a problem. So uh, that, that's the question to Jason. Uh, and I have a really good answer. Um, there are many levels to this type of vertical time travel. And uh, most of the time, you're an unseen observer. So you can just take in the environment. Therefore, you cannot affect or alter anything. Um, the next level is your consciousness could actually merge with a being in that timeline where you can actually see through their eyes, hear what they're thinking, but you can't uh, affect anything. You're just a, um, an observer again, but you have more ability uh, to sense that world. And then the next level to that is a complete takeover. And I've actually experienced this um, a couple times where your consciousness actually takes over someone else's body in that timeline. And I, it's like I will be Jason in a different body. And um, when that first happened to me, I was very excited and I ran around trying to talk to people and they just whipped me out of the body. <laughs> Jason, if you had the ability to go back and witness Christ, we talked about it, uh, speaking to his apostles or doing what he did, would you try to save him from the cross? Oh, with the knowledge that we know today? Yeah, I no, think, knowing uh, what you know, or would you let it happen? I think you have to allow history to take place. See, I, I, think, I think he would tell you to leave him alone. I would agree with that. But another point that I have to say is that there are beings that are in the future that have mastered time travel, and when they go back into the past to, let's say, feed a new civilization, it actually creates an alternative timeline. Right. So in their, their future is still exactly the same. They haven't changed anything, but they've created this parallel world or parallel timeline. Let's go out to Kansas City. Joe's with us. Hey, Joe, what side are you on, Kansas or Missouri? On the Kansas side, sir. Thank okay. you for taking my call. Mr. Sure thing, Joe. Uh, well, earlier you were, uh, your guest was talking about the um, past lives experience and the reincarnation. Um, when he reaches out, do you are you sure that you're not just reaching out into the ether into a what you were talking about earlier with the uh, collective consciousness and not maybe touching the more dominant of the consciousnesses that might be out there to maybe, like you were talking about with the uh, possessions of, uh, you know, maybe the Julius Caesars or whatever were coming to you versus like you were talking about being able to be into somebody else's body such as that? Um, I will I'm give that sure. to you, Jason, but uh, yeah. give us, Joe, real quickly a specific question if you could. Well, like, okay, so you're talking about the uh, reincarnation. So and within the ether that you have the, the collective consciousness of all these other things. So basically think of it as another dimension, heaven or hell or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. Are you sure that those weren't just the stronger ones that were coming to you to show you their lives? And is that maybe why you think that there is reincarnation and not just a collective um, consciousness? There's a couple things to this answer. Um, one is um, through your DNA, you can actually connect to ancestry. And a lot of people think that's past life, which in a sense it actually is. Another thing is that um, I've experienced um, past lives where at the end of that past life, I die. And the next thing I know, I'm crying as a baby. And I have that complete memory from one life to the next. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Jason and Bob, we are out of time. We're going to time travel our way out of here in a moment. Good luck with what you do, both of you. The book is called Forbidden Knowledge, Revelations of a Multidimensional Time Traveler. Our two special guests tonight have been Bob Mitchell and Jason Quitt. Jason, of course, being the time traveler. And when you go to bed tonight, maybe you too will be a time traveler. Don't forget on our next Coast to Coast program, investigative reporter Linda Moulton Howe joins us with incredible stories of high strangeness. She's uh, done it again. Another great month of programs for you on Coast to Coast AM. For Dan Galanti, Tom Dan Heiser, Lisa Lyon, Lex Lonehood, Sean Ladasor, Stephanie Smith, Chris Morrison, George Knapp. I'm George Norrie, somewhere out there on Coast to Coast AM. We'll see you on our next edition. Until then, be safe, everyone.
From the heartland of America and the gateway to the West, good morning, good evening, wherever you may be across the nation, around the world. I'm George Norrie. Welcome to Coast to Coast AM. Later on tonight, time traveling. Here's what's happening. Health officials are still searching for the source of a very serious blood infection linked to at least 18 deaths in the Midwest. The bacteria got its name from a microbiologist, Elizabeth King, who discovered it in 1959. Symptoms of the infection include fever, chills, headache, neck pain, and skin infections. The most at risk for complications are newborns, the elderly, and people with compromised immune systems. The bacteria does not usually cause illness in humans, but in recent months, it has sickened dozens and killed 17 people in Wisconsin and one in Michigan. China has deployed anti-ship cruise missiles on a disputed South China Sea island, and the missiles are raising new concerns in the Pentagon over Beijing's growing military and its vital strategic waterways. It could be a tense situation there. And North Korea has once again asserted that it will use its nuclear weapons arsenal against the United States. Unlike previous statements, however, a note from the rogue state's foreign minister insists that North Korea is now fully equipped and ready to use nuclear weapons on the United States, not just willing to do so. They are ready. Charles R. Smith is an expert on North Korea, and uh, Charles uh, has told me on many, many occasions that he used to think that uh, Kim Jong-un was a buffoon, was a fool. Uh, Not anymore. I think a lot of people are starting to get serious and and are really trying to decide now what we are going to do with North Korea. A patient who thought that she was losing her battle to cancer and married her fiancé while on her deathbed in the hospital made an unexpected recovery and recently renewed her vows with her husband. What an incredible story. She's from the United Kingdom. She had ovarian cancer, a tumor the size of a watermelon. Everybody thought, she's gone. She's history. Well, she got married to her fiancé, Robert, and somehow everything went into remission, and she's okay. She's doing much better, but they renewed their vows this week. Good for them. Well, if you're a vegetarian, take heed. They say that genetic mutations will raise the risk of heart disease and cancer. Populations who have had a primarily vegetarian diet for generations were found to be far more likely to carry DNA, which makes them susceptible to inflammation. Scientists in the U.S. believe that the mutation occurred to make it easier for vegetarians vegetarians to absorb essential fatty acids from plants. Well, authorities have arrested a 17-year-old kid, the teenager booked in New Mexico. He was one of several people who apparently smashed a flying saucer at Roswell, New Mexico. It was a decorative spaceship. It was on display at the International UFO Museum. Three people grabbed the disc spaceship. They loaded it in the back of a pickup truck. They took off. They smashed it. But surveillance tape caught them all. One kid arrested. Let's check in with what's going on in the skies these days with Dr. Sky, Stephen Cates. Stephen, go ahead. Hi, George. Uh, so many wonderful things happening, and I think we should start off with the planet Jupiter here. If you like, have clear skies right now throughout the coast audience, look high up in your skies. You're pretty much, I would say, halfway up in the southern sky. But here's what's interesting, George. People are telling us here and reporting this. Amateur astronomers back on St. Patrick's Day evening imaged in their own telescopes with video cameras two large explosions on the planet Jupiter, meaning something indeed has hit the planet, and I don't find that odd at all, because over the last decade, five major objects have slammed into Jupiter, a total of six of these, over the last 22 years, and we should all be grateful for Jupiter, because it pulls in so much of that errant material from space. George, I'm out here with the telescope, looking at Jupiter live for the coast audience right now, and you could follow along. You have a small telescope, take a look on the right side of Jupiter, George, the satellite Io, and the satellite Ganymede, the largest satellite in the solar system, hugs the right side of Jupiter, And I can see the shadow of Ganymede right on the planet Jupiter. Everybody can see that if they go now. To the left of it, the satellite Europa, just to the left edge of Jupiter's limb. And then way out there, you can see it, is Callisto. But, George, pay attention, folks, to the evening of April 6th. We're going to have so many wonderful events happening with Jupiter and its moons, so many eclipses, so many transits. It's a nice night to prepare for, April 6th into the morning of the 7th. And finally, George, in our weekly update, and I appreciate that, Take a good look in the early morning sky, folks. If you look just before sunrise, you'll see that last quarter moon hugging the southern sky and to the right of it, George, the planet Mars starting to get brighter, and Saturn right in between, making a beautiful way to end the month of March. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sky. I appreciate everything you do. 
Well, almost a year ago, almost a year ago, we had Bob Fletcher on the program talking about Incoming, the only expose of the incoming of Nibiru, his DVD. We're going to talk with Bob in a moment on Coast to Coast and get some updates on Planet X. Stand by. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. Let me tell you a little bit about Bob Fletcher, multifaceted entrepreneur, international consultant, manufacturer, merged a small toy manufacturing business in 1985 with a corporation that turned out to be a supplier of weapons for the U.S. intelligence agencies worldwide, involving the highest level of covert operations. Now, this merger placed Bob in a position of becoming a federal witness and led him to permanently becoming an investigative researcher, by the way, um, and uh, his DVD called Incoming, the only expose of the coming of Nibiru. We're going to get updates from Bob for the next couple hours on this incredible story. Bob, always a pleasure. Welcome back. Ah, thank you very much, George. It's uh, good to be back and say hi. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, been, uh, it's been an interesting life. It has been about a year, I guess, yeah. since I was on. We're getting close. Yeah. When, by the way, when you were making toys, what kind of toys were you making? Uh, they were, well, the primarily, uh, there was one main uh, toy that I, it's kind of like an invention of mine, um, that originally we were selling to m- professional magicians, as a matter of fact. Uh, but then we realized it was like a, uh, everybody that ever saw the, the toy function wanted to take one home. They all said they wanted to take it home for their kids or their grandkids, but the reality was that the, the adults wanted to take them home for, them, for themselves. It actually was a, uh, a, we made a, it's like a puppet, a hand puppet, it's about oh, 12, 13 inches long, and it's um, uh, made. Of, it was made of rabbit fur, which we got from Europe uh, for the most part, overseas, uh, where they they where they eating rabbits all the time. So there was plenty of it available. But it was a, a raccoon, a skunk, and a fox, uh, and one was an all white fox. And uh, they, the point of the toy was that it's manipulated externally by your hands when you're holding it, but they absolutely look alive. Um, I've had uh, most people when they f- very first see it, they absolutely are positive that it's a live animal, <laughs> and it just sold like hotcakes uh, so profusely. I went, it looks like one, two, three, four. I, um, I started making them, selling them. Uh, actually, it's a part-time thing because I was at that time doing something else at the same time, and um, I uh, we started selling them to magicians. They were on. They've been on every every major magician in the world probably owns one of them, um, and. So they were going great. I even opened up a um, couple of retail operations, which were, in essence, they were like magic shops. Mm-hmm. But the primary toy was it was this uh, raccoon and a skunk and a fox, et cetera, uh, that we um, uh, that, that just looked like it was alive. I mean, it's, you know, it's it's very very deceptive. Again, being an interest to magicians, obviously, uh, it was that good. But uh, that's what we were doing, and the um, uh, retail operations. Uh, they were great. We were going into amusement parks, and uh, it was uh, again that was the primary attraction. Uh, where were these uh, toys that absolutely looked like they were alive? We called them. I called them spring animals. But the 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 point being actually that it was just a a large spring inside the body of this toy, and you learned how to manipulate it, and uh, it's a, it's extraordinarily a hot item. It really killed me when um, I ended up being. Uh, ripped off by merging my business with this other business that appeared to be... And what did they want your toy company for if they were suppliers of weapons? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, later, you know, once I realized what was going on and they recruited myself, they uh, initially uh, were attempted to recruit me, uh, and of course I, I didn't get involved with it, uh, but I, and I was never paid properly, so we pursued legal action. But one thing led to another, and uh, like I say, we discovered it was uh, actually these guys, wh- which were military generals, they were the guys that actually ran the Vietnam War, period. My uh, God, the, Bob. The, the movie um, of uh, Air America, where they were smuggling the drugs and gold in and out and arms and what have you during the Vietnam War, that was uh, the those military generals that were overseeing that operation were the people that were um, involved with taking taking over my company and mer- merging it in uh, with what was technically like a, uh, a quasi holding company, so to speak. Uh, they owned, uh, they bought and sold businesses on a regular basis. They didn't sell them very often. They usually ended up bankrupting them. Uh, but they were in and out of everything you could imagine because 
what they were using uh, and the intent with my business was the same as they had done for many years. All these little covert war operations that the United States uh, uh, covert operations carry, uh, carry out on a regular basis with national security and the CIA, et cetera, et cetera, overthrowing like the Nicaraguan thing, which I ended up right in the middle of the Iran-Contra inquiry, which that was during arming the Nicaraguan uh, rebels, the Contras, and supplying them with weapons. Um, and, and, it's, and, and I don't even have trouble naming names. It was a General John Singlob, General Heine, Adderholt, uh, Heine Adderholt, uh Richard Secord, General Richard Secord. These were all the three primary guys that were, in fact, Oliver North, who was the, the key uh, uh, character in, in the inquiry, so to speak, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North, he worked for those generals, and those were the generals that basically ran all of the covert operations and, and the out-in-front military operations in the Vietnam War, period. Of course, this was several years later, and what they do is, as the old thing about old soldiers never die... They just fade uh, away, maybe? <laughs> right, in this case, old covert soldiers uh, never die. They just keep doing covert operations. Uh, Jeez, so, Bob. The, uh, the, to answer your question in, in terms of what they needed a toy company for, uh, they used companies like myself. They wanted to recruit me to go to West Africa, uh, where they were going to expand. Like I say, they were already doing the Iron or the Contra, mm -hmm. Contra mess in Nicaragua. They were dealing, of course, on the drug side. Now, that's the, the big side of this thing, was smuggling drugs back into America after dropping weapons off in South America, they would load up the planes, fly them back into the United States Air Force bases, and offload narcotics right out of the same plane. Were they going to use the toys to stuff no, them in? No, no, no. And, and uh, excuse me, I diverted off again. The bottom line was they simply wanted me to go to West African nations that they were about to expand, overthrowing one of the governments. I think it was in Angola. Uh, and the... Um, idea was that I would simply be an information courier. I would go over there. I had this legitimate toy company. I could... Um, it was go, a front. Go strictly as a front. I can go over without anybody paying attention to me, go in, touch base with a, maybe some local manufacturers, uh, maybe buy a couple of dumb toys or something over there as with the intent of bringing them back over here for sale, and pick up and deliver information strictly as an information courier. God knows what I would have ended up being and doing. Actually, I would have been probably dead, although I was almost dead a few times later when I became a federal witness in several inquiries, actually, uh, with the Congress and the Senate besides the congressional uh, inquiry with the uh, Iran-Contra mess, which was the, Nicarag the Nicaraguan business. Besides that, I got involved with them. Um, uh, I was even hired by Manuel Noriega's attorneys, as a matter of fact, Man, later on. When, you, you were in all the wrong places at the right time. Well, I, you know, what it, it, see, what the, the point was that these guys, the four or five primary characters with this, um, basically those were the guys that coordinated all around the globe, all the little covert, overthrow governments, supply the revolutionaries with weapons, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, on the basis with... CIA and the national security, et cetera. Uh, they uh, also would be, for let's use an example, two or three of those guys may be involved with two or three other covert operatives to, to do something else. Like I said, in uh, maybe Angola or West Africa. Uh, maybe the next following year they'll be in uh, Iran, or excuse me, in Iraq or Iran, or in the case now, covert operatives are constantly involved with theoretically chasing ISIS over there and supplying uh, the different weapons and coordinating the uh, movement of weapons, et cetera, covertly under the radar, so to speak. And it would always be the same guys and mixed maybe with two others or two others from the left or the right or whatever. So what happened after I uh, had the nerve to shoot my mouth off and become a federal witness, uh, I would get a senator and congressman I was involved with ended up being involved with Arlen Specter, uh, Henry Gonzalez, uh, just a whole long list of all the different congressmen and senators that were running these varieties of investigations. Uh, usually they end up 
the left and the right chasing each other. You know, all these inquiries at the congressional level are completely fraudulent. It's complete garbage. You know, the, uh, nobody's ever gotten in trouble. And even when Oliver North was found guilty and admitted to lying to the Congress and all that, everything, nothing ever happened to him. Um, as a matter of fact, he just enhanced his bank account for the following 10 years. And now he's got a television show. And uh, he literally was found guilty of drug smuggling and murder. And now, now let's, let me ask you this then, Bob. Yes, How in the world, with all this, did you get involved with the hunt for Nibiru, Planet X? Well, it, it, I wasn't. And normally, I, I wouldn't normally not even pay attention to that, George. I, that, that, to me, was a kind of a, you know, a, a nebulous kind of an unknown thing. It was maybe out there, maybe not, and all the rest of that. And it's kind of a, was it like a fun thing for you at the no, time? No, 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 not at all. No, I don't have time for fun things. And I'm, I'm an old <laughs> guy now, and I still... Uh, I'm up to my keister in in uh, pursuing uh, many many uh, interesting situations from an investigative side of things. I should be just retired and not doing any of it. Uh, but no, what happened was someone approached me and asked me a few years ago now, going back maybe three four years. Somebody came and said, "We have these extraordinary amount of money disappearing out of government funding of, of a, a large sorts." Uh, now we're not we're not just talking multi millions, which I was used to tracking down, so to speak, where you had a, a congressman who wanted to build a home uh, illegitimately with uh, stolen funds one way or another in Tahiti for his summer holidays, and uh, chasing that type of thing was rather regular. But this was billions, and then it ended up being trillions with a T, vanishing out of a variety of uh, covert funding, military contracts and things of that sort. And it was extraordinary money. Um, the uh, drug smuggling, which covertly has yielded huge amounts of money for criminal persons in our own government at the highest level for many years, that was like peanuts compared to the money that was disappearing. So I had been asked, would you kind of just look into it? I, you know, I said, look, I'm not doing this like I used to do it many years ago, and I don't have the contacts as much like I used to have. Uh, at the highest levels, CIA people and the Pentagon and et cetera. Hold on for a second, Bob. We're at the break. We'll come back and find out how you got involved in the search for Planet X. Planet X, Nibiru. You've heard us talk about it before. We'll be talking with Bob Fletcher about it again when we come back on Coast to Coast AM. George Nori back with you on Coast to Coast with Bob Fletcher as we talk about Nibiru. We're talking about incoming, the only expose of the incoming of Nibiru. So, Bob, let's let's get back to how you found out about Nibiru in the first place. I mean, were you listening to Coast to Coast? What happened? No, as a matter of fact, and I know you had talked about it many years ago. You were probably the the first uh, talk radio program that had the the the, the nerve or or <laughs> was nutty enough. <laughs> But um, to, to talk about you, you actually got into it many years ago. Mike. Yes, we did. Yeah, our, our show did with Art. Uh, we started talking about it. Uh, uh, I started talking about it about 13 uh, to 15 years ago, and uh, we've never stopped. Right, and, and I, like I said, I had no interest in it, and it was kind of like so far out for me commonly. Uh, I, I wouldn't even have looked at it. But what happened, as I said, I had been uh, at somebody, uh, actually a couple of people, and they had asked me, uh, hey, you know, can you kind of just quietly snoop around and, and try to figure out where all the, this gigantic amounts of money was going, besides the fact that all the gold was gone from Fort Knox, and there's no question about that. That does not exist. It's gone already. And that I would include in uh, the, the vanished money related, interfaced with uh, the incoming of Nibiru. So I said, anyhow, I said yes, and I started looking at it. And uh, originally I couldn't figure it out. Uh, I mean, just I was getting bits and pieces from a lot of directions. And then finally somebody said something about, um, well, what happened was I, I first it, it directed me. I, I ended up uh, realizing and discovering uh, in depth uh, something.